Welcome to the Clock and Talk, an Arsenal podcast. I'm your host, Tez. Thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading this week. And I'm joined each and every week by two brilliant minds. And I call them fucking guests every single week. So this time, I'm going to say regulars, resident, legends. Tony, how are you, mate? Yeah, I'm good. I'm glad to finally not be a guest. I think I've made over 50 appearances this season. Uh, completed my first full year with the, the podcast. So I'm no longer a guest. <laughs> no, no. I'll probably get a testimonial soon. I, I got sick of calling guests. I thought, geez, I've got to think of a better name for these lads. <laughs> I've been here more than you and I'm still a guest. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he's here every week. Schwinn, how are you, buddy? I'm doing well. It looks like I've been promoted as well. So some popularity, as as people on Twitter like to call it, has paid off finally. Yeah, we'll talk you off the fence, mate, and give you the uh, house key, and you can uh, stay in for a while, mate. Uh, happy to. Let's see how things go from there. Next season is, is not too far away already, I feel, especially with the way the summer is going to go. I think there's going to be a lot of conversation for us to make anyway. So we'll be back, but it's good to know that I'll be a regular. Absolutely, mate. Um, now let's get into a couple of things. Yeah, I don't, just before we briefly touch on this Huddersfield game, because uh, we've got heaps of questions to get through this week, I want to touch on a um, uh, chapter, an era, however you want to word it, uh, has closed. Arsene Wenger, 22 years at Arsenal manager. Uh, one of the greatest managers I've probably witnessed in my lifetime. Um, some will disagree with that these last 10 years. Yes, haven't been that great. But the respect I've got for the man is um, uh, just on another level. Um, you know, I've grown up watching Arsene Wenger uh, take over at Arsenal and go on Arsene Who when he came in, and um, here we are 22 years later. And I just think to myself, and I was thinking to myself today, actually, there's, uh, I'm a little bit older than some blokes out there, and there's other blokes obviously older than me, but I think the people that, when they're kids, when they've got kids... Um, in 30 years' time, I think we'll be still talking about Arsene Wenger and what he'd accomplished and what he'd done at Arsenal. Um, because we are very lucky to live in such an era of his presence at the moment. Um, and it was, you know, brilliant 22 years, but uh, the last probably five years for me, uh, apart from the FA Cup trophy where I was screaming my head off after he won that... Um, yeah, I was really proud for the man, so I'm, you know, a uh, bit sad on the day, but all in all, it was a um, uh, a great little era of football and uh, watching him as manager. Um, Tony, you got any any last words on Arsene Wenger's career, mate? Yeah, I mean, there's not much that hasn't been said over the last few weeks, but not only by us, but by everyone, the media, other fans. Uh, just everyone worldwide. It, it was a great time. He, he took us to a level that a lot of us uh, that were around pre Wenger thought Arsenal would probably never reach. Um, so yeah, it, like, it's gone a bit stale and it's not been the greatest. But we've got to remember, even in his worst five years at the club, he gave us three FA Cups. Um, so I mean, you have to love and respect the man. Um, was it time for a change for me? Yes, absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind. And I think, I know we're going to get onto the game, but I think uh, yesterday showed that what we actually saw on the pitch, I mean, there was a few people around me in the ground that were saying what we was watching football-wise reminded us exactly why it was the right decision for him to move on. Mm. Um, so although, although the day was about him and it was a carnival or party atmosphere, what we actually saw on the pitch sort of made everyone know that, yes, we are here for a good time. Yes, we are here to celebrate what he has done. But it is there it is also clearly time for... A, a new venture mm, couldn't agree more um, Schwinn look I could go on and on on Arsene Wenger but uh, I'll keep it brief because we've had an episode about Arsene and we spoke in, in length about him so all I'll say is thank you and God bless you for for, for what you've done for our club and how, how you served our club and, and all the best to you I don't want to make the whole episode about him but um just quickly, Tony, uh, the future of Arsene, do you think he'll be sitting in the stands next year? He'll take up this boom whisper of a general manager's role at PSG um, or, or or just go and retire and play a bit of golf? Uh, I think he'll still stay in football. I mean, unfortunately for him, he's lost his, his wife to this club. 
uh, uh, he, he's lost his life to football in a sense. And don't get, he's had a good life because of football, but his life is football. So I'd be very surprised if he goes and retires now. Mm. Uh, I said a few weeks, probably a month ago on, on this podcast, that I'd either expect him to take the general manager or whatever title they give that role at PSG or uh, look at an international job after the World Cup. I don't, I've not seen anything that, that's changed my mind on that. Um, I think that's the direction he'll probably go down and it would lessen the workload which it, whichever one of them roles he was to take it would lessen the workload but still keep him involved in football mm-hmm. you agree with that Shui? it's really tough to say I mean the wound is so fresh and even if someone heard you know the press conference he did after after yesterday, yesterday's game his, his final press conference I don't know whether it was by accident but he used the word retire that I, re- I should have retired every week, seeing seeing the jubilation and the celebration around him. That, that could have just been a slip-up. But I think it's too fresh right now for, for me to give an objective answer. I, I think he wants to be involved in football, but I just don't see him taking a, a front office role or a general manager role. I think he wants to be in football. So I think he'll take the next season off and, and see how things go. He has a summer, so the World Cup is going to be something he'll be you know, doing some pundit work for. So let's see how that goes, but I, I actually see him taking a year off and maybe then deciding where he wants to go ahead. If I had to give you an answer right now, I don't think he'll go back into coaching ever again. Mm-hmm. I tend to agree with you a little bit there. Um, I think he may take a year off, play a bit of golf, but he'll be in the stands at watching just about every Arsenal game or, or every Arsenal game. Uh, and then he might look at doing something you know, the year after or something. Um, I know football does run through his blood, so it, it would be very hard. But all the best to him, and uh, all I can say is thank you. Um, OK, let's get on to this game, boys. So uh, Huddersfield 1-0. Um, Tony, it was a lineup that you pretty much expected? Uh, yes and no. I didn't really know what to expect. I, I know when we, we spoke last week, I, I had real trouble picking the lineup, and I, I can't overly remember what I said, so... I don't know if I was right or wrong. Um, again, when when the, it's similar to, to the Burnley game in a sense that the game the match wasn't overly about the match; it was about the occasion. So so whatever team was picked, it wasn't it wasn't the the main thing. Usually, ten minutes. Oh, I mean, sorry, an hour before kickoff, you're looking what's the team, what's the team. But even being around the ground, there was no one sort of rushing to see to see who, who's going to start. Um, I think given the the players that travelled. He pretty much picked the team that was expected. Um, he potentially could have put Welbeck in for a Wobie as the only the only maybe, especially considering Welbeck got dragged off to 15 minutes on on Wednesday. Uh, but apart from that, there was no no, no real shocks for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you're right. It was pretty much about the the moment because when I seen Welbeck come on at the 67 minute, we'll get into the whole game in a minute. But I thought, well, that's that was an interesting substitution for me, but. Um, uh, where it was almost he wanted to reward a few of those players. Um, uh, Maitland Niles was another one. Monreal was another one. Um, so it seemed more of I know it's a hard term, but like rewarding them players for their and thanking them for the season. And we'll give you the last twenty minutes or something um, on my last game. I could be wrong, but that's just the impression I got. But mind you, I was probably a little bit intoxicated at the time, so. Uh, <laughs> I had a few bit beverages last night watching the game. So, uh, Schwinn, what was your take on the lineup, mate? As expected, to an extent, I was surprised to see Chambers miss out. I don't even think he was on the bench. He he got a rest last week. Uh, well, not last week, but midweek. So I, I figured that he might be rotated in after having a few decent games in the last month or so, or maybe the last couple of months. Check missed out once again. I, I don't know what's going on there. He was not involved on the bench either. And Jack, you know, Jack gave, Jack's wife gave birth to a baby girl last week, and that, that could be the reason. But you would imagine that he would probably want to feature on Arsene's last game and, uh, and on the club's last game of the season. So there were a few odd omissions for one reason or the other. But otherwise, there's not really a whole lot you can complain. The, the front three was, was potent on paper. And the midfield looked stacked as well with it will be Shaka and, and Ramsey. So not a whole lot of anxiety before the game, but but certainly a few questions. Tony, there's only the one goal really, mate. Um Abemiang assisted by Ramsey on the thirty eighth minute. That was it. 
You want to get us for, walk through that goal with us? Yeah, good goal. Uh, nice football. There was a little bit of luck in the build-up. I think it was uh, Mkhitaryan tried to play the ball out wide and it, it reflected slightly back in field. But, but nice football. Um, we've said it time and time again, Aubameyang just sniffs goals. Mm. Uh, he was in quite a strange position. Instead of being in the middle of the goal where you'd probably expect him to be, he actually went behind the last defender where, in theory, it looks like unless you're offside, they're going to cut the ball out before it gets to you. But obviously he wasn't. And, and that's what we're saying. He has a nose for, for what positions to take up. I think Ramsey done well. Um, he he realised that he didn't have the, the, the room to open his body and go for the far corner himself, so stabbed it across goal. Um, but, and I think it was Lacazette who played the ball through to Ramsey and he just lifted it off the floor. And I think yeah. had it gone along the floor, the defender would have got it. So it's something so tiny, it was only a two-yard ball. But I think that little lift on the off the floor just made the goal happen, really. But yeah, a nice football, good goal. Um, once again, I, I don't know if Schwinn, I don't know if you saw, you were obviously watching on the TV, but on my TV, I, I still not sure where Abemian come from. Yeah, and he is one of those players who will sniff out a chance. And thankfully, that's not something you lose with age. We we have been concerned about that a bit on this podcast, particularly about how over the next couple of years he might lose, you know, an inch of, of pace. But th- that sort of instinct, that predatorial idea of, of sniffing out a chance, you don't really, you know, you, you, you cannot teach someone that and you don't lose that with age. So seeing how Lacazette performed for, for the majority of this season, I think Aubameyang compliments him really well. And, and I don't think anyone really expected it to, to work in this way. I think many people expected good results. But no one in this particular way. What really surprised me about the way Aubameyang took this chance was when Ramsey gets the ball, and as Tony said, he 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 does not have the, the time to open up his body, and he stabs it across goal. Aubameyang was essentially between their two central defenders, but he actually instead of continuing his run through the middle, he actually took the outer lane and and realized that the ball had enough pace on it. That, that, that's serious recognition from someone who who is so good in the box. Mm. So I think that was the only time we actually threatened and, and looked to score a goal up until you know the very end when Welbeck and Mkhitaryan and Lacazette had a chance. But for the first 70-odd minutes, that was the only time we threatened and, and we took our chance, which, which has been very rare away from home. So credit to the boys, good build-up, you know, lazy passing at the back. And suddenly we turn the switch on and, and we find ourselves uh, at the mouth of their goal. And Obama does really, really well to finish that. Um, Tony, last week, Huddersfield, they were obviously <laughs> fluted it and got past relegation against Chelsea on a 1-1 draw. Um, however, geez, they played with some spirit in this game. It, it was almost like they, um, they had nothing to lose and, and they threw everything at us. It was, uh, and I'm just looking here, there was 18 shots in total... Um, I'm just trying to look. Oh, there's only the three shots on target. Um, 44% possession to Huddersfield, 56 to Arsenal. Um, yeah, so well, that was they were they were a mighty little team, weren't they? Yeah, I mean, they'll admit, and I was obviously speaking to a lot of their fans yesterday. That they're not the, the best quality team in the world. Uh, to use my most hated word in football, they play with a lot of passion. They play with a lot of heart, a lot of determination. And sometimes, if the other team aren't up for it, that can make up for the lack of quality. Um, you don't have to be the most gifted player in the world to run more and try harder than, than your opposite number. And, and that's what's kept them up, essentially. Um, I don't know if it was just because they were safe and it was a bit of a party atmosphere, but they've got the best fans of any ground I've been to this season. I don't know if it would have been like that on a normal day, but I can only judge on what I saw. Um, I've, I've been to every away game this season and they by far and away had the best fans and again it is like that 12th man they can drive you on especially when your game's not really built on quality I'm not saying they don't have any quality but their game's not built around slick footballers so when it is about effort and determination and running power that roar from the crowd gives you that extra extra yard or that extra bit of determination uh, but yeah they're, they're a gutsy little club um, nice ground Good fans, good knowledgeable fans. Uh, interestingly, I was speaking to a couple of them while getting a beer before the game. And uh, I said to them, what did you expect from this season? 
and, the, and one bloke said, I'm 50 years old. I've never seen us in the top division. He said, I couldn't care less if we would have been relegated by November. I just wanted to say I'd seen it. Yeah. He was like, to stay up was beyond any dream we ever had. Well, there you go. Uh, that's, 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 that's unbelievable from a fan, isn't it? That's, that's all he's worried about. That's all he cares. Here we are worried about fucking top four. Yeah. Wow. Well, um, look, I'm just going to give a shout out because he is an Aussie bloke, Aaron Moyes. Yeah, he, he stays there, Huddersfield, so I have to give him a shout out. Um, I believe he's had a really good season too, so that was good to see. And uh, could moan the Socceroos into the um, final of the World Cup, boys. <laughs> yeah, probably not. <laughs> as long as we beat England, I'm happy. Um, <laughs> OK, Swin, uh, what was your take, mate? Huddersfield, little battle in a little good little time? Yeah, they pressed us high. They weren't faced by the Arsenal, which, you know, of course, we've not given a lot of reason to to necessarily do that this season uh, away from home. But, you know, as you said, Tez, you know, they've, they've battled relegation and they're, they're no longer in that fight. So the onus was lifted off of them in that regard. And they were happy to play. I think David Wagner said before the game that we'll give Arsenal a fight. And that's exactly what they did. They unsettled us really well. And what I found very interesting, and I've been surprised not a lot of teams have, have done that to us, is that they let our goalkeeper have the ball, Ospina, uh, as of yesterday. And that, considering how bad our goalkeeper's distribution can be, is, is a very you know, decent game plan to have, I would say. And that caused a lot of trouble for us as well. I think when we did get past their, their press on, on a couple of occasions in the first half, we, we fumbled the chance and, and couldn't really make the most of it. Aaron Ramsey found himself in decent positions a few times and, you know, there were instances where we were at three on two and Ramsey just had one of his worst games, I feel, away from home. I want to give him some benefit of the doubt considering it was the last game of the season and it was a party atmosphere, as Tony just said. But, you know, it, it, when you when you take this game and you see it as an isolated incident, then you have to question what was going on there, especially when the game is still deadlocked at nil-nil. So Huddersfield did very well. I think the fans did very well. Credit to the club for showing a lot of class before the game started by giving Arsene Wenger a guard of honor, who did eventually make it to the to the away fans. Um, we had a little bit of a, well, not we, but I had a little bit of an argument the other day about Arsene Wenger making it out there or not and what that symbolizes. So... A lot of class shown by them. Good luck to them next season. And I think they've done very, very well to stay in the division uh, this season. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, now, Tony, we'll get on to a couple of months. not much really else. We can dribble on about this game all day. But it, was, it wasn't, uh, wasn't an exciting game and a 1-0 draw. But we'll just touch quickly. Um, so the substitutions, Welbeck, Monreal, uh, Niles come off. Wavy went off. Uh, for Monreal and Abemiang for Welbeck. Yeah, um, yeah, they happened. Sorry, I, I don't, it wasn't, I don't wasn't really it. a question, mate. It was just, yeah, sorry, I put up with you on the spot there. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean, I don't. I know, I know you you said earlier that you see it as giving players a run out, like for example, I don't. I think they're natural substitutions. It won't be. You can never really play seventy more than seventy any. And he did that on, on Wednesday with 10 men. So he was always going to be uh, dragged off quite early. And he didn't have the best of games either. No one did, in all fairness to him. That, again, that's not digging out of Wobi. Uh, Kolasinac, again, fitness issues and played 90 on on, Thursday, on Wednesday. Sorry, So, again, pretty obvious substitution. And then one of Lacquer or, or, or Aubameyang was going to come off for, for Welbeck. And it, it was Aubameyang. I think it's literally as simple as that. Uh, so I, I didn't see any any surprise in the substitution as well. I will say because I know we're not probably going to cover it. Is I thought Maitland Niles was excellent when he came on. He just looked a different level in in terms of composure and and understanding and, and positional sense. Uh, he made one mistake where he played a poor ball out wide, and then he made a foul uh, to recover it. And and everyone that listens will know I applaud that. He fouled the guy 40, 45 yards out before he could get into a dangerous position. So his one mistake he made about ball in my mind, as I said, he got a book. I mean, he didn't get a booking, sorry, he gave away a foul. But for me, it was a good foul. Um, so I thought he looked very bright when he came on. I was. Um, I don't want to say I would have been happy, but 
when um, a spooner, he looked like he got injured, and I just can't remember what minute it was. Um, and I see Matt Macy warming up on the bench, and I, I was actually looking forward to having a look at Matt Macy when he come on, but it wasn't to be. Um, but we'll just go quickly. Who was your man of the match? Uh, Aubameyang. Aubameyang. Uh, Schwinn? Aaron Moy. Yeah, he was good, wasn't he? He was really good. And uh, I was surprised to see that he was very comfortable with his left foot as well. I have seen a bit of Huddersfield this season, and he hasn't been the greatest, just just to you know, give some sort of rationality to this. But I thought yesterday he was very, very good. And if, if it hadn't been for that last chance that he took that hit the crossbar, I think if he had scored, then maybe you know, more people would have seen his performance uh, in a microscope. But I thought he was excellent yesterday. So he hasn't been real good, he all, season. Been real good all season. He's been decent. I wouldn't necessarily say that he's been their best player. I haven't seen enough of Huddersfield to just say that. But on occasion when I have, you know, since I speak to an Aussie almost every day, I've been concentrating on him a bit just to see what sort of prospect he might have for the World Cup and whether you've been getting, you know, interested and excited by him. And we haven't heard anything about Aaron Moy from you all season, have we? So I think that that is another testament to how he's been. I was actually going to say, why, why do you hate the Aussies so much for? <laughs> you know, I don't. <laughs> they're, they're, I know there's two people you watch very closely, Aaron Moy and Grand Chaka. We hear a lot about Grand Chaka and not a whole lot about Aaron Moy. <laughs> I, actually, funny enough, I just haven't caught many of Huddersfield's games. I did watch a couple early in the season, and I think if you go back a couple of the early, early podcasts, I did mention him a couple of times, but um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't watched much Huddersfield games, so I don't know whether they've been on the same time as Arsenal or just haven't really flicked around much. Um, so, he was your best. Who was your worst? Uh, tough one. Adam Ramsey. Well, wow. I think he was a well below par yesterday. Selfish. Lethargic, which is not how you essentially describe Aaron Ramsey. You know, it was, it was tough to get out of the press, and that requires a lot of mental and physical work. But when you lose the ball upfield, especially after battling a press, you have to make sure that you get back into position. And Aaron Ramsey, for me, yesterday just didn't step up to the mark enough. He, he did himself well by getting that assist. Some decent build-up play uh, was involved as well. But uh, on, on a whole, I thought he was, he was poor. Okay. Um, I'm going to say... Look, Tony did say Bamiang, and it's very hard to disagree, but I've got to give a shout-out for Spina because I think it could have... It almost could have been one all, um, which was what I predicted, or 2-1. Um, he made a couple of really good saves, I thought, so I'll have to give him a shout-out. Uh, my worst was probably Rob Holding. There was a couple of little errors that I did see, and I thought, just haven't got it yet, mate, have you? Um, I just... And, I, and then I start questioning whether Chambers would be better situated. And, and I, for me, I think Chambers is the better, better option than Rob Holding. And I think, and we'll get onto it, um, I think, next podcast, but I think Rob Holding's one that should head on loan next season. Um, Tony, you got a, uh, your worst player? or? Yeah, I mean, obviously on Twitter I had a rant about Aaron Ramsey uh, last night, so people would expect me to say him, but I'm not going to. I actually didn't think he was that bad. It was just a couple of situations in particular that pissed me off. I, I'm, a, I'm a big Mkhitaryan fan. I really like him, but I thought he was awful yesterday. Yeah, OK. I can't disagree with that one either. Um, uh, Can I also give a special shout-out to Mustafi and how bad he was yesterday? <laughs> You know, he, he's he's not the tallest guy out there, but he contests every header like he is. He thinks of himself like a Bermuda sacker, it's... and that doesn't help him. You know, <laughs> I think their, their, their forward, Mounier, was winning every header. And, you know, after two or three times contesting those headers, you have to think, okay, you know what, I'm not going to win this battle. Credit to him, I think he won it once. But every other time, I think Mounier got the better of him. And when you... When you become the aggressor that way and you leave that space behind you open, then you're leaving your center back partner and the right sided fullback, you know, in, in a fix. And maybe that's why Tess, you thought Rob Holding didn't have a decent game because he had more to do than he should have. 
you know, I think Mustafi's decision making is so absurd at times. And I really do think he can benefit with a new coach who can drill into him that don't make the silliest decisions. Because I really do think that's all it is with him. But at the moment, I think he, he's been seriously below the mark. And yesterday was, I think, an illustration of that. Don't count last... Oh, it's, I suppose you've got to. But um, last week, uh, Mafropanis, we, he got the red card. But So we've had Rob holding Mustafi now. We've seen them this game. And then the game before, was it Manchester United, Mafropanis and Chambers? Was that a, That's right. Yeah. So, so what's your thoughts on? You've seen both pairings together: Rob Holding, Mustafi, or Chambers and Mafropanis. Hmm. It's a difficult question because if you look at the performance that Mafropanis and Chambers put in at United, there's not a whole lot you can take away from them. Despite us having lost the game yesterday, we won the game. But I thought Mustafi was shocking in certain instances. You know, the, the, the score line really throws the whole 90 minutes into a fix because at the end of the day, you have to go by the result. But I think I, I'm going to have to sit on my fence here because <laughs> oh, I you, fucking knew you, you would <laughs> <laughs> because you, you really have to give these players more time and Mabra Panos particularly, you know, I've said before center backs have to be judged in pairs, but till the time you get a new manager, I don't really want to jump to a conclusion very quick. I want to keep an open mind. And I'll boost you up onto that fence and sit there for a minute. Um, <laughs> Tony, same I, I, I'm a permanent now, so I'm happy to do that. <laughs> Tony, same question to you, buddy. Um, I, I, I don't really want to judge them as parents because it's not either or. It could be a mixture of them two. It could be Mustafi and Chambers. So I, I think it's not the brightest idea to, to judge them as a parent. And I, I disagree with you. I thought Holden was good yesterday. I thought he was good against Leicester on Wednesday. Um, the, it, the, do you judge on the highs or the lows? If you go on Mavropanos' high, which was United and, um, what was the other game, Burnley, then you say he's good. If you go on his low, which was 10 minutes against Leicester, you say it's bad. Um, so, I, I mean, I wouldn't answer in pairings. I'd say, look, if someone said to me, who's going to start the next game and everyone's fit, well, all four of them are fit, Mavropanos would not be starting for me. Okay. So, the Chambers, Mustafi, or holding a Mustafi for you? Uh, yeah, just, just because of seniority. Um, and, again, if you're judging on pairings, that they've all played, Mustafi plus one has played as a pairing. Whereas Holden and Chambers have probably only played two or three games for, for us as a parent. It's really hard for me because I a couple of weeks ago, um, well, yours, I mean, the main Schwinn, um, we did say Chambers was absolute shock. And so I've actually, he's changed my mind. Um, I'm not saying I'd like him to start because I really think if a, a manager next season, he's going to have a huge job on his hands. And to sort out that back line, um, Oh, Monreal, Klasenac, Holding, Mustafi. What's going to happen with Bellerin? Um, you got Mafropanis, Chambers. So it's and you look at all of them and you think, well, Bellerin's probably, you know, if we keep him, he's a starter, and Monreal's a starter. So your two centre backs, he's got a big decision to make on who does he put out on loan, um, and even if he keeps Mustafi and let's say Chambers. Um, what backup does that leave us if you send Holding on Mafropanis on loan? So it's 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 going to be. Yeah, I think I can see two centre backs coming in in the summer. I think that that's what we're going to do to strengthen. Um, I'm not I'm not happy with Mustafi. I'm not happy with Holding. I don't want Chambers to start and Mafropanis. Just a little bit too un- inexperienced. However, I did praise the kid and and I think he does have a big future. Um, Bad all you want to touch on, boys, in that game? Just quickly, uh, just for our listeners, just to remind them, this fence is three people strong now, so please don't come at just me with these accusations of being a fence sitter. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> you've been copping it, buddy. <laughs> I have been, but it seems like this week I have company, so I'm happy to share it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, okay, you got anything else, Tony? No, um, that's, that's that's all she wrote on on the actual game. I just want to 
I, I don't. Are we going to come on to Wenger coming over at the end, or do you want me to speak about that? Um, speak about it now, yeah, because you were there. So, yep, go for it. Yeah, so after the final whistle, um, a few players went went to come over towards and thank the away fans, as I've spoke about before. And uh, the the Huddersfield fans had a pitch invasion, so the Arsenal players were all being shooed away. And and Tellers would like to hear this that Xhaka was like walking over, like pulling fans out of the way to try and get over to the away fans to clap. And the Arsenal player liaison guy made him like grabbed him and made him go down the tunnel. Um, so then every Arsenal fan stayed. Uh, so the final whistle's gone. We're all staying. We're, everyone's waiting for Wenger to come back out. And after 10 minutes, nothing, no announcement. Uh, some people leave. The majority, vast majority are still there. After 20 minutes, again, no announcements, nothing. So again, now probably the majority have left. There was, I think, 2,100 there. By after sort of 20, 25 minutes after the final whistle, it was probably down to maybe 700 people left there. Then another 10 minutes goes by, still nothing. And there's probably down to about 300, 400 people in the stands. Um, Huddersfield fans have all gone by this point. The Arsenal fans are still there just singing at an empty pitch. Uh, for anyone that was on our Twitter, I put a few videos up. And I, I was literally just about to leave. I said to my two mates I was with, I was like, we're good to go. I was like, yep. Stood up. As we stood up and gone to turn around and hear, hey, like, turn around and Wenger's come out. Uh, it's just come and give everyone a little clap, um, walked along the front row and high five people and whatnot and, and walk back out. And it was just a, it was just a good touch. Mm. Um, just in terms of PR, I, I tweeted before when it looked like he wasn't going to come out, that it would have been a PR disaster to have a whole away end waiting there and, and no one come out, not, um, not players, not manager. Um, on the opposite, it now looks like very good PR because, so you got to well, give him credit. It's not for that. hard to do, is it? Like just come out and say, you know, thanks to the fans. So. You say that, but it doesn't always happen. Uh, yeah. Not only at Arsenal, uh, uh, at many clubs. Uh, there was a I saw I heard an interview on the radio with Sam Allardyce last week, and they said, "Oh, why didn't you come out for the lap?" And he said, "Oh, I had to do the media obligations, which take twenty odd minutes, and then I didn't see the point." So Wenger could have easily said that he said, I didn't come out for the first twenty minutes because they're not allowed to. Essentially, they have stuff to do. And then, um, and then uh, after that, I couldn't be bothered. I wanted to get home. He could have easily said that, but yeah, he didn't. Okay. So it's just, just, again, it's just positive PR. Yeah, good on and, and good on Arsenal and on everybody for coming out and saying thank you to the fans. Um, geez, he had some security around him, didn't he? Yeah, no, I mean, there was a lot of press. Well, there was loads of stewards there anyway, just blocking. Because there had been a pitch invasion, there was a whole line of stewards standing in front of the fans. So they weren't there particularly for Wenger. Oh, OK. Yeah, when I seen on the TV, I thought, "Wow, he's got some bloody um, security there." Yeah, no. As I said, the stewards went there, and he sort of broke the line of the stewards, and they caught sort of circled him, but he was right up in like within touching distance of the fans. And as I said, he was shaking people's hands and high fiving them and whatnot. So mm-hmm. um, it wasn't like he was completely protected from from the people, so to speak. Very good. Okay, I want to get on to a couple of things, boys. Um, the manager stuff. Okay, so Allegri's come out. Uh, Juventus have wrapped up the league. Uh, they won that... Um, oh, what's that trophy earlier in the week, bloody... Anyway, whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, that Top one. Italian. Yep, yep. Uh, they won that during the week, and, you know, we're all a bit optimistic. Oh, look. Here we go. Uh, but some comments were made during yesterday, I believe. I didn't see the press conference. But going on Twitter, um, it was pretty much saying that he's sticking around at Juventus next season, Tony. Well, he said, I think I am, which is a really weird thing to say. Yep. Um, I'm not going to read too much into it because I don't know how the translation comes across. Um, some languages, they don't have the exact same words that we do or they, they structure sentences differently. So it may have made perfect sense, and it's just the translation's a bit weird. But I think saying I think I'm staying it is a bit weird. It's like when Pochettino a few weeks ago after Tottenham lost in the semi-final said, oh, whether it be me or whoever's here next year, that doesn't mean he's leaving Tottenham, but it's just a weird thing to say. And that's kind of how, how I view the, the Allegri stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, having said that, they've still got a game to play, and they're still going to christen themselves champions and, and have a parade and whatnot. So... I wouldn't expect him to come out the moment they've won the league when everyone's on a high and say, oh, by the way, I'm off. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't. I wouldn't expect that to happen anyway. So I'm not saying he's definitely going to be our manager. I don't read anything into those comments. 
Um, for me, I still think he's the favourite. He's still my pre- uh, preferential choice, and I still think he's the most likely. But I'm not for a second saying he is definitely going to be Arsenal manager. Um, what's your take on, and for those who aren't gamblers and whatnot, but bookies have put his prices from what I'm hearing back here, or what I've read is back out five to one from three to one, so it's drifted out a little bit. Um, that would pretty much be on the back of the comments that were made. Uh, so a lot of because our tech came falling down, but I checked this morning and he was back into two to one again. Okay. So, um, and uh, when I checked this morning, it was maybe uh, five hours ago. He was still favourite, and Arteta was second favourite, but it was very, very close. So, um, I, I don't think things have changed that much with the, the bookies thing. Of course, when he said something like that, the odds are going to go out. Mm. But then, anyone who like me thinks that you can't read much into that would have then probably backed him at higher odds. Um, and then it comes back down again. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it all goes in circles when you when you deal with bookmakers. Mm-hmm. And they're only going on what they're only going on the information they're to be hearing as well. So, and and weight of money. So they they could hear information that that says I oh, is definitely not going to come and put the odds up. But then if loads of people start betting at them high odds, whether they think he's coming or not, they're going to shorten the odds just to protect themselves. Yeah. Yeah. No, true. Um, since you mentioned Arteta, because he's second favourite, so um, an interest. I don't know if it was in the questions or not, but it's. I'm getting the vibe that it may split the fan base. What's your take on that? Yeah, uh, I, I think it will. Um, look, I, I'll categorically say it now. I don't want him to be Arsenal manager. Will I support him if he's Arsenal manager? Of course I will. I support Arsenal above anything else. So I want Arsenal to win, whether Arteta's a manager, whether... Harry Kane was the manager or whether whoever the worst person in the world you can think of without getting too atrocious is the manager. I want Arsenal to win. Um, but I, I don't want Arteta to be our manager. He's, he's not one of my first choices. He probably wouldn't be in my top five choices. Mm. Uh, the, the issue I think will come out where I think there could potentially be a split. And I was talking to one of our followers about this the other day. Um, if it's when he comes in, if he does come in and, and we lose a couple of games, that's when there'll be the split start. So I, I compared it to, to when Conte went to Chelsea. They didn't have a very good start. They lost, uh, I think they drew a couple of games. They lost to Liverpool and then the next game they got battered by us at Emirates. We won 3 0. And not a single Chelsea fan was calling for it in his head. They wasn't worried. It was like, okay, new manager, new project. He's a world class manager. He's, he's won the league in Italy, blah, blah, blah. And they gave him a chance and he turned it around and he won the league with absolute ease, if we're honest. Had that been Joe Cole, who came in and had exactly the same start, the fans would have been absolutely on his back. And I use Joe Cole because if I'd have used Frank Lampard, you could compare that to a club legend. He's clearly a a, a Chelsea club legend. And I don't believe Arteta is a club legend. I think he was a good player for us. So I, I say someone like Joe Cole. So had Joe Cole come in and been the Chelsea manager last season and... I think they were fifth after they lost to us that day, 3-0. So they're fifth. They've been embarrassed by us. They'd lost to Liverpool at home. They'd drawn a couple of other games they shouldn't have drawn. Would the Chelsea fans have given him the same chance they'd given Conte? I don't believe so. And I think the Arsenal fans would do exactly the same. Had If, say, Allegri comes in and has a couple of shaky results, everyone will go, ah, oh, but he's won the Italian league four years in a row. He's got to two Champions League finals. Let's give him a chance. This guy can build something. Whereas if it, Arteta has exactly the same results, I think people... Or some people will go along the lines of, well, why is he here? He's unproven. This is just his level. His level is we lose and we get battered by by these other teams and we draw at teams we shouldn't should draw. So I, I think it will cause a big divide in the fan base, potentially even bigger than the Wenger one. Mm. Because I think, the, especially for the last 18 months, I don't really think there has been a divide with Wenger. I think pretty much everyone's wanted him gone. It's just that, at what level, uh, how much you're willing to protest, how much you're willing to abuse him. But uh, I didn't do either of them things, but I still didn't want him to be Arsenal manager any longer. So I don't think there was a real divide with the last 18 months. The 18 months before that, there was a huge divide. But the last 18 months, I don't think with Wenger, there, there was really a big divide. But I think Arteta could cause a, a proper, properly big divide with some people saying, I'll oh, give him a chance. And others saying why he's never shown us that he can do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, Schwinn, what's your take on it, mate? Will it split the fan base? Absolutely. There's no reason why he should be given the job. I, I cannot, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, be objective and, and not go with my heart here, but 
there's not a single reason that comes to mind why he deserves the job. I think the only reason he'll get it, if he gets it, is will we'll provide a bigger insight into how unprepared we were when it came to making this transition. You know, we've heard that the only reason Arson announced his exit is because we had a verbal ag- agreement with, with Max Allegri. If Ivan and co are unable to get this over the line, it would be a massive slap in the face. And you have to then try and analyze whether letting Arson go was the right decision to make. I don't think many people will argue that Arteta is a better prospect for next year for just one season than Arson. I mean, I'll throw this question back at you guys. Would you have Arteta or Arson for the next season? I think Tony's made his point pretty clear, but Tez, what do you think? Um, I'd have Arson again, and I'd have Arteta as my assistant to come in the following year. Well, so I think I think you just answered that question pretty straightforward. And I mean, I don't think an assistant manager really has that much of a role at a football club, to be to be very honest. You know, they they are an important placeholder holder, but it really could be anyone. It could be Boldy or Arteta, for all I care. Especially under Arsene's style of management. But you know, there it is. You just gave the answer that it's it's you probably want Arsene and. Any other hint of Arteta coming in, first of all, I think is just media driven. I don't really think he's that up there in the pecking order when it comes to selecting someone. I can see Ivan having a certain proclivity for him because he may not want all the funds that a Max Allegri or a, or a Luis Enrique would would probably desire and you know and want. But Arteta would do anything for this job, I feel. You know, he, he'd become a yes man to, to get the job and then try and make something off it. And when you look at an Enrique or Allegri or even a Yogi Lo, I think they would be much more straightforward. And to someone like Ivan, who wants to keep the, the, the strings and the purse tight, I don't know if that, that's necessarily a good option. Again, we're just speculating here, but if we go down that route, you have to question how ready we were. And in my opinion, Arteta is not going to become the next manager. And let's hope I'm right. Yeah, I hope you're right too, because Arteta, for me, he just hasn't got the, uh, he just hasn't got the experience. Um, and, and you're talking a big team. Like you had a look at Enrico when he jumped in the role and he took over Roma. Now he was only there for I think maybe one season, might have been two. Um, but it wasn't until he went back to Barcelona, and as, as I've said here before, that Barcelona squad was a good squad. So uh, he wasn't ready to become a manager at that time. Uh, I'm not saying Arteta is like that, but when I look at Arteta and I look at what he has done, um, yes, OK, he's, he's done a, a, a good little apprenticeship at the moment, but... Uh, is it enough to step into a team like Arsenal? Or would you like him to jump into a Crystal Palace or watch him do something there for a season and then say, OK, well, let, yeah, Arteta's our man moving forward? Um, me, that's what I'd, I'd, I'd much prefer to see, what he's going to be like, even at a, a, even at a team like a championship team, Leeds United or Fulham or something, or Fulham might be on their way up. But, um, you know, someone like that, like a lower team, I want to see what he can do there before he takes hold of, hold of Arsenal. Um, and let's face it, Arsenal, I know the last two years we haven't had the greatest of seasons, but we are a, we, we should be a top four team, lads. Um, so, a tether for me, I have to rule out. Um, and yes, I think it would split the fan base exactly for the reason Tony said. We lose a couple of games, uh, it'll be our tether out, hashtag our tether out, probably more than the Wenger out. Um, Tony, I just had a quick look on the Sky Sports, uh, so Sky betting thing, and our tether's 6 to 4. Uh, Brendan Rogers seven to two. Allegri's also at seven to two. Now that is a little worry for me. Brendan Rogers. I didn't even think of him at, when we were discussing managers. Uh, yeah, he last I saw. Uh, I'm going to try and get it up now. He was well out, uh, nowhere near. Yeah, uh, he was. I looked last week and he was well out, and then I, I looked back this morning. He was still. I he was still well out, and then I've, I've looked again now, and it's like I said. Second favourite at seven to two with a tether at six to four, and I think, wow, well, Brendan Rogers. Um, so I put it back to you guys on another question: a tether or Brendan Rogers? 
I, I don't want either, uh, <laughs> but I, I would prefer Rogers, and I know mm. probably a lot of people disagree with that. But he's had not, not only he's had Premier League experience, he's had first team experience, he's actually had managerial experience. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, look, the, the, my biggest issue with Rogers is he, he you've got if you look at his best side, which was his Liverpool side, they they were brilliant going forward and awful at the back. That's no change. We're we're good going forward and awful at the back. We, I think we need someone a bit different. To, to, we don't need someone that to continue what was, Wenger was doing. If you want to continue what Wenger was doing, keep Wenger. Mm. Um, I, I mean, look, I've, I've said all along. I think the place needs to freshen it up. But I, I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't go anywhere near Arteta or, or, or um, Rogers. And then we've got Lewis and Rico. He's at eight to one, and <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, Patrick Vieira. He's at ten to one. Um, but this is where you can start to ignore odds because start to ignore the I, rest, can, I, think. I can get I can get both of them at over thirty to one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's just as I said at that point you can start ignoring odds when I'm looking now and I could get Vieira even off a standard bookmaker that anyone can walk in and put their bet on. Uh, I can get Vieira at twenty to one, Enrique at twenty five, and that's just looking on one website. If I'm sure if I hunted around, I could get even higher i'm not promoting betting kids by the way <laughs> yeah no i see what you mean once you get past the top of the you know the top top four you, you're starting to stretch out the no man's land um same question to you schwinn a tether or brandon rogers fucking hell that's a horrible choice isn't it <laughs> i'd choose neither i mean i'd probably choose castration over either of those <laughs> okay so schwinn will uh-huh. be on chelsea talk podcast next um <laughs> next year <laughs> I, I will quickly i will quickly say that i don't think we should pay too much attention to these odds especially at this moment i think it, we're very early into the stage and if there's anything that the buvach incident provided was this was you know case in point for this because he was 201 coming into the week suddenly he takes a day off to go visit fan, family because of his you know ailing dad reportedly oh yeah that's and right. yeah and at? he fell down to something similar. You know, he was what four to one or, or something. Six very, nine, very close. Sixteen to one now. So yeah, he, now he's risen again. So yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't pay too much attention to any of that for now. I think as the media pendulum swings, these odds have to swing to accommodate for any of that. And we we will hear more as time progresses. And you know, I think it will be made made more evident that we are close to naming a manager. Maybe that's when we should start looking at the odds to get an indication. If you want to get into the game early, then, of course, right now is the time to bet. Again, we're not promoting betting here. But to get an indication of who will become a manager, looking at the odds right now, I don't think will do you much good. Yeah, anyway, it's uh, going to be very interesting, boys. So we'll find out what happens in the next couple of weeks. So Teta, Rogers, uh, Enrique, Allegri, um, Charlie, whoever else in the hat. Um, let's get on to some questions, lads. So we've got heaps here, and once again, thank you everybody for listening, and thank you for your questions because uh, it wouldn't give us much to do if we didn't have a, have all these questions. So it's awesome that you guys have show us support. Um, you can fire your questions at us, and and you can do it any time. Uh, Tony's on our Twitter most of the time uh, at clock and underscore talk. So if you've ever got anything to ask, just just ask it. Um, okay, Shree the Gooner has just thrown me a curveball because as Shree, as I just said, Shree has just echoed, or I've echoed what Shree said. Uh, we've had bucket loads of questions lately. Looks like the popularity of Schwinn is benefiting from you guys. Well, let me tell you, buddy, Schwinn is on a big contract here. Um, well worth his weight in gold. Uh, well, me probably worth more than me and you, Tony. Yeah, Schwinn, Schwinn's the top man at the moment, top dog. He's he's the legend, isn't he? You going to add anything on that, Schwinn, or what? You're just going to sit quietly? <laughs> no. <laughs> let's, just, let's just move on. Get off your I don't want anyone pissed. Say something. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's well, a, he's, he's, he's weak on my position because I was looking to renegotiate my contract for next year, having completed my first year with Clock End Talk, but now we've got a new star man. I, I might not even get offered a new deal. <laughs> Looks like I did the right thing. It was almost almost like a premonition when I called you the Aaron Ramsey of this podcast in a way then. 
considering <laughs> Taz has called me the Mesut Ozil. Uh, Tony's looking for, for a transfer fee. Any podcasts out there, uh, I'm cheap. I'll speak often, probably too much. Hit up my agent, have my people speak to your people. <laughs> as long as I get a cut, I'm happy. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, to, to everyone listening, you can find Tez and me to, to get you good odds on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Vish is asking, Tony, uh, what in your opinion has the reason for our pathetic away record this season and how do you we correct it next season? It's been a shocker, hasn't it? Yeah, it has been terrible, but I feel like I've been asked this question every week and I don't really know the answer. Um, look, there's, there's no reason for it. I think being bad at the back doesn't help because you don't have a foundation to, to build from. You're more often than not going to be under more pressure at times away from home than you are at home. And our, our defence, and I don't mean our back four, I mean our whole team defensively just don't seem to handle that pressure. At any time our defence is called into question, they, they tend to, to fall apart. And when you think of the times they haven't, you think of some quite good away play. I thought Chelsea away early in the season was a very good away point and, and it was built on a solid defensive display. But I think our, our, our back or our defence is so bad it can't handle any pressure and away from home you encounter more pressure than you do at home. I think that's probably the easiest way to look into it. I'm just going to go on another, uh, you know, looking from a different point of view. Um, what's the preparation? Uh, you know, are we catching buses? It's obviously the ground, trains, planes. Um, do you think that takes into account much? Or you know? No, because they wouldn't have changed. They wouldn't have changed this season from what they've done in the past. It all depends where it is. Uh, I would imagine, I don't know, I'd imagine yesterday they got the coach the whole way back because Huddersfield isn't particularly near an airport. And by the time they got to an airport and had to deal with I know they don't go for a normal check-in procedure, but by the time they had to board the plane and all that, it, it wouldn't have saved much time. Uh, so I'd imagine they, they drove yesterday, but somewhere like Newcastle, they would almost certainly fly. They got the train to Manchester. It all depends where we are, but they wouldn't have done anything different this year from what we've done previous years. And just the cast aspersions, um, Awobi, he was out drinking earlier in the season. Do we think that's happening Prior, prior to any games or, you know, Venga, a, a few people have said that his type of loss the control room was questionable this year and, and, you know, players seem to be getting away with a little bit. Do you think any of that's going on? on no, no I mean, or, you know? no, as I said, I don't think there's any diff, anything different from normal. It would have... It would have come out if people were out all the time or, or out drinking. The thing is with Iwobi, and I know I hammered him at the time because he bloke broke club rules, but it wasn't the day before a game. Mm. It, was, it was on the Friday night and we played on the Sunday. So, yes, he's wrong. Yes, he's broke the rules, but it shouldn't, even if he, he got completely wasted, it shouldn't impact how you play 36 to sort of hours later. Mm. Um I mean, he's a young lad as well. I know hangovers lasted a lot less when I was when I was 21 than they do now. So, I mean, he would have been fresh again by the Sunday. I'm not condoning it because he, he broke the rules. But, again, I don't think that's a, a thing that's going on all the time and has a huge impact on our away results. Uh, interesting. We stay, in, we stay in hotels for most home games anyway. So, if it was a case of, our oh, once they get in the hotel, they're all going wild, then the home form would be the same as the, the away form. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, Schwinn, Vish, asking you again, why is why is Rafa not being considered for Arsenal's job? Well, he, he's on the odds, but he was about twenty five to one. I didn't mention it because once you start getting down to that list, you're type of thinking, well, um, he's he's not even in contention. But Vish does ask Schwinn, uh, look what he's done at Newcastle with no budget. Our stingy board should should love that. <laughs> he's a, he's an experienced manager of Champions League, and I'd rather him as a candidate than Arteta. Look, ideally, I'd rather not have either of them. You know, we we've spoken about having a particular style of play and and maintaining that. Allegri does that to an extent, but what's very appealing about Allegri to all of us is that he'll fix our defense while maintaining some of our attacking football. I don't know much about Rafa. You know, he's he's gone away from England after his stint at Liverpool. He's done decently well at, at Napoli. And, of course, he had that failure of his stint at Real Madrid. But I think Rafa hit a ceiling there. 
uh, at Liverpool. And if ever since it's it's mostly been you know downhill for him. Don't get me wrong; he's done very very well at Newcastle, but it's a it's a different game being the manager at the Arsenal. And I'm not particularly fond of his style of play. And I, I wouldn't have either of them, Arteta or Benitez. So to me, I'm glad that he's not involved in the conversation. What about you, Tony? Uh, Schwinn pretty much echoed what I wanted to say in terms of style and play and stuff. Mm. Uh, you've also got to remember he took over uh, the Inter team that just won the treble and, and didn't do too well with them. He, um, I think he's a good manager. I don't know if he'd fit us. If you're asking, if you had a gun to my head and said, it's him or Arteta, you, Tony, from the clock end cho- uh, talk, get to choose who is our manager, I would choose Benitez. Hmm. Yeah, but I, I don't think he really fits us. He's known to be a man, and we've seen it year in, year out, like quite negative. I don't want to say negative. I want to say very good defensively. Um, that's always made him a good cup manager because you can get away. If you have six clean sheets in a row in a cup, you're probably going to win it. Um, whereas six clean sheets in a row in the league may not get you anywhere, and it's it's over a long time. Um, so I don't think his style particularly suits us. I know we need a change, but with the type of players we've got, um, you're going to need you're not going to be able to change them type of players into a pure defensive type of team. So while I would prefer him to Arteta, um, I don't think I, I wouldn't want him as the Arsenal manager. Schwinn, just quickly, you did touch on our style of play, and I think, Tony, you mentioned it as well. I have to disagree with you boys, both of you, because I don't care if we play... I, I, I don't care if I play boring football. I want the three points. I want... I want. Yeah, but you've got games. to think... I, I agree with you. I, I'd, I'd rather win every game 1-0, but you've got to think what would suit our players. I don't think our players are capable of playing that style of football. Uh, the Ramsey, the Wilshires and whatnot. Oh, you could go. You go through all of them. Look, yeah, yeah. if Jack, if you've got one criticism of Jacker, is that his defensive contribution isn't isn't as good as people would hope. Mm. Ozil doesn't. It isn't the greatest defending. I'm not saying he doesn't try because I think that's lazy criticism. But he's not greatest. We've been playing a Bamiyang on the wing, who's never going to be a, a, a great defender. Iwobi's not brilliant defensively. Mkhitaryan's never going to be brilliant defensively. So you're just you're running through all the players that bar Iwobi probably start, and you're going, oh, not great defensively, not great defensively. Even at fullbacks, Hector's not great defensively. Mustafi's not great defensively. <laughs> Monreal, Monreal's 34. Kolasinac isn't great defensively. So I think to bring in someone with that kind of style, of course I'd rather win every game 1-0 and be boring but win the league. Hmm. But to bring in with someone that kind of style, I think you'd probably have to sign 15 new players. Hmm. I think the, um, obviously, I, the attacking style of football may, I think it'll take a bit of a, a back seat, to be honest. I could be wrong. We may get a manager who comes in. But even a Brendan Rodgers, I don't think, will come in like a, like a Wenger-style attacking football. Um, it's going to be fucking hard, though, isn't it? I don't know where to start. I don't know. Yeah. And another name that's sort of just you know disappeared into the mix is uh, Hardim from Monaco. You know, I think he provides a very good balance. And as opposed to an Allegri, I'm, I'm pretty sure he'd be happy to work in a restricted budget as well. I think he's shown his defensive prowess with some of his Monaco teams, and and he can maintain an attacking shape and good scoring, well-scoring teams as well. I'm not sure what's going on there and why the media is just not talking about it, and neither are you know the in the nose. So that that's one that one is a little baffling to me. But I'd probably take him over Arteta. Well, I'd definitely take him over Arteta, Benitez, Rogers, Enrique. You know, uh, it's very surprising to me that he's just disappeared into the oblivion. Yeah, well, he's that far down the list that's with Lewis, uh, Louis van Gaal. So that's how far he's down the list. So I, I don't even... He, he was up on the list earlier in the piece, but... Um... Are you talking about the odds? Yeah, sorry, the odds. Yeah, yeah, the odds that I had up earlier. Um He's not even. Yeah, yeah. yeah as way, I said, way, I would, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't necessarily look at the odds list and you know transpose that as the list as as we have as a club, but maybe no news is good news, and maybe he is someone that you know we are considering, and there is some talks going on behind the scenes, but it's surprising to me that not a lot of Arsenal fans in general are talking about him right now. You know, maybe we are talking about whatever we're reading at the moment. But more than an Arteta and some of the other names I mentioned, I'm pretty sure at least all of us on this podcast would agree that Hardim is the man. 
I um, had an interesting conversation and it, and it gave me some food for thought. Uh, Claudio Renrieri. <laughs> Absolutely not. No? No, stay away, please. Uh, no, it was just... Uh, I, know, I know what you're saying, but <laughs> he's not a bad manager. He's been everywhere, though. Mm. Yeah, and he's never stayed anywhere. What's he's the reason a, for that? Yeah, I know. Mm, something's, something's odd there. Um, actually, I think it was Glenn Baxter, so I'll give him. I'll throw him under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Glenn, but you had a shot of Shackle last week. No, the block you, mate. So, um, okay, the Texas Gunner. Um, who are we up there? We'll go with Tony. What are your expectations in a new manager ironing out some of the wrinkles in this squad? How much, how much time should he be given? How deep, better do you think our tissues truly are? Toss your clothes in the dryer or tip to the dry cleaners required? Um, uh, it's it's going to take time, especially that we are going to have some form of change of style. Um, so it's not going to fix itself uh, immediately. What mm-hmm. I would like mm-hmm. to see is the, the fundamental problems um look towards there being ironed out. So I don't want to see whether it is Ramsey at the club or not next season. I don't want to see the midfield being empty too regularly without reason. I don't want to see us getting caught two on two at the back with both fullbacks pushed up when we're either, when we're not, obviously I understand that when we're chasing a win late on, but when it's, when they're 10 minutes into the game and nil, nil, you, I, I don't want to be seeing that. So I, I think time has to be given for the project as a whole but I would expect to see the, the fundamentals or the huge errors changed within probably the first two, three months. <laughs> I'm just looking down at this odds list. Sol Campbell's got a shout at 101. <laughs> He'd be well, Wenger, Wenger was 200 to 1 this morning. <laughs> was he? <laughs> but Sol yeah. Campbell, he'd be proud as punch to be even on the list on that list, wouldn't he? <laughs> oh, that's close. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, MAA Gunner, how long do you think it will be until we see a new manager? We'll, go, we'll stick with you, Tony. Uh, well, I've said within 10 days to two weeks of the season ending. Season ended yesterday, so I'll go within 9 to 13 days. Jeez, that quick. I, I, I think they've known for a long time. Um, oh, you think they know? M- who it is? M- I think so. I think they've probably known ever since they made the announcement um, that, that Wenger was leaving, whether that's because they've got a verbal agreement with someone and they, they just have to negotiate with their club if they have a club um, or what it is. But I think they've they've identified someone they want, be it an Allegri or an Arteta or, or any of the other names on the list. I think they've identified that for person and had positive talks with either that person directly or that person's agent. Actually, since you bring it up... Um what do you make of the sackings the other day? Um, do you think that's a good indication of what they, you know, what you just said? Well, my my initial reaction was that it probably ruled Arteta out because does he have his own staff to bring in? I, I would assume not, seeing as he's only ever been a sort of member of that staff at Man City. I think people forget that he's not even the assistant at Man City. He's a, he's a he's a coach. And by all accounts, he mainly works on video analysis, which is a huge part of the modern game. But it's a big leap to go from there to to the main. So, as I said, it's going to be a head coach role. So it's a, it's a big step to go from there to from the video analyst, essentially, to the to the head coach. So I, th- I th- initially thought them sackings indicated that it was probably not going to be someone so inexperienced. But then we're already hearing who the who the, the incomings are in, in some of the positions. So whether, again, whoever that new man is has, has had a say in that or not, hmm. obviously I don't know. I'd expect so. I wouldn't expect them to to bring someone in and say, oh, we've just hired this coach, that coach, and that coach, and they've got sort of gone, you have to go and work with them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Schwinn, which of the current squad from Vish... Uh, which of the current squad will be will will be or should be playing for us next season? Will the World Cup be a hindrance to the new manager, as he would have limited time to work with them? There's a lot in there. Uh, I think there's a two a big couple question. of so so which of the yeah, two separate squad, questions. Which of the current current squad will be or should be playing for us next season? Well, let's t- let's 
let's touch that on next week's podcast because we're going to do our ins and outs. Um, but right. let's let's do our second part of this question. Will the World Cup be a hindrance for the new manager? A hindrance, yes, of course. You know, an an, an ideal summer would be no tournament, so that players and agents are free to negotiate, and you know, you're not waiting on players to get out of training or out of a game or something like that. But I don't think it's going to be too much because a the World Cup is going to run what a month, maybe seven weeks, uh, well five weeks, sorry. But you have to remember those will only be two teams at the very end. So a lot of teams will dissipate, as Tony said last week, that a lot of teams will, after the group stages, you know, be removed from the tournament and they'll be free to negotiate. Hmm. But that that is not to say that we don't want to do our business early on. Apart from having a manager already identified, and I agree with Tony there, I think we also have players identified. And some people may ask, how can you have that without a manager coming in? But since we've changed the infrastructure around the club, I think our targets have been identified by Sven and some of the other scouts as opposed to just a manager. So a manager might come in with some of his demands, which can be met during the tournament and after the tournament and maybe even before the tournament. But we, that, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do our, the majority of our business early on. And keep in mind, um, the end of the transfer window shuts. First game of the Premier League, doesn't it? They brought in yeah, the can I, can I, yeah uh, so it's the, the day before the first game of the season. But just to, to butt in on the answer to that the question, I, I think it'll be a massive hindrance, but not for the reasons that Schwinn's saying. Um, obviously, the World Cup does play a factor, but... In general, teams will come back to preseason training the first weekend, of, uh, first week of July. That is going to sort of be entirely impossible for every player that goes to the World Cup. And although I know it's the same for every team, but if they don't have a new manager, all them players and no already know the manager's systems and stuff. Whereas we're going to have so much to learn under a new manager, a new style of play, or a new way to go about things. And we're going to have a lot of players that are going to have a very, very short preseason. I think even if you go out in the group in the world cup, it's probably, you probably finish towards the end of June, uh, say the last weekend in June. So there's no, and then I think most contracts say that you have a minimum of four weeks off, but usually in world cup years, people only take two or three. So say you go out in the groups and you take three weeks holiday, that's probably say the 21st of July by the time you even come back to pre preseason training and you haven't done any running yet or kick the ball. So I, I think it's a huge hindrance, but more in that sense than transfers. I mean, I think our first friendly, I think is either the 23rd or 28th of July. So our new manager's first game, first chance to see their players in actual action is going to be 23rd or 28th of July. But there, there's a good chance that a lot of our players are either on the first week of their holiday still or, or nowhere near, nowhere near even returning to the to the squad. Or if they are, they've been back with the squad for three or four days and nowhere near match fit. So just having a quick look. So obviously Ozil, he's going to be playing World Cup. Mikatarian, yeah. he's not. Uh, Ramsey, he will be. We don't know about Jack. Shaka. No, Ramsey's be. not. Ramsey's not. They didn't oh, qualify. Ramsey's not. Okay. Um, oh yeah, of course. Yeah, Wales didn't qualify. Um, Shaka will be. El Nenny will be. Uh, will be. Abemian won't be. Lacazette, I would imagine he would be. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, if, I mean, if you go through him, he's going to. It won't be Will. The, yeah. Both fullbacks have got a chance. I think at least one of them will go. Mustafi will go. We don't know who our keeper's going to be. We don't know who our other centre back's going to be. Mm. I think a, a, a good portion of the, the first team players will be at least in the squad. Mm. Yeah, so we will be light on. Won't be a big, won't yeah. be a big part, but yeah, there will be. Yeah, your key players will be, and that's where you want you want your, you want your key players. Well, it's not even that. It's not. I, I don't care about losing the friendlies, but it's to get in the time in to learn how this manager does things, how he runs his sessions, mm. what what plans he wants to implement, what system he wants to implement, even as much as what formation he wants to play, or what roles he wants people to take within that formation. If you're busy at the World Cup, as I said, there may be six of the first team there and five not, but then five won't know how to fit into that system, which messes up the whole system. Because if you're going to, say, build a system with a 10, that system will be completely different with, say, an Urzel at a 10 as it would with a, a Jack or a Ramsey at a 10. Mm. So 
I think it's I think it's a huge hindrance, and I don't think people realise how big a hindrance it is that the World Cup. It's the same every World Cup. I'm not saying this is a special situation. Yeah. It's, it, it affects us more than it has done before because this is the first time since the World Cup in '94 that we've had a new manager or a different manager. But uh, keep in mind, and I know it, but Conte he took over Chelsea Europa League. Uh, not Europa League, Euros, and um, then they come out and won it that, that year, didn't they? Yeah, but as I said earlier, how did the first 10 games go? Yeah. yeah. When, and did he change formation after 10 games because he didn't have enough time in pre-season to implement his plans? That's where we don't need an Arteta. He, I don't and, the Euros, mm. and the Euros also ends a hell of a lot earlier than the World Cup. Yeah, okay. And they went out of the Euros in the quarters, I believe. Um, yeah, I think I did. Yep. Yeah, because Portugal beat Wales and Spain, uh, sorry, France beat Germany. So Italy went out at least a round before that, if not two rounds before that. But I think it was the round. I think it went out in the quarters. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. they was probably finished by, say, July the 1st. And he wouldn't have taken a holiday because as an international manager before that, he would have done not much work in the six months before that. Mm. Okay. Um, MAA Gunner. Uh, Schwinn, how long do you think it will be till we see a new club owner? <laughs> wow. Big... No definitive date on that for sure. It could be my lifetime. It doesn't look like Kroenke is looking to sell at any point. And he seems to be, I mean, his son seems to be making some some changes around the club as well. So it doesn't seem like that they are, you know, not fascinated with this asset anymore. So not in the foreseeable future, that's for sure. His son must be a big football fan. Is he? Well, his son in general is just a sports fan. He's He's been around a lot of franchises in America. I know he spent a lot of time with the Denver Nuggets, which is an NBA team. And he's also uh, spotted every now and then with the Avalanche and you know some of uh, the other, I think, the Rapids, which uh, I'm not too familiar with. But J- Josh seems like a decent chap, if I'm honest, from from the few interviews I've I've read. Or he, he appeared on the Adrian Wojnarowski uh, podcast as well, where he spoke about Arsenal and some of the other sports franchises that the Cronkies own. But to have an interest in something doesn't necessarily make you good at it. And... Um, American sports, I mean, Tez, me and you had a conversation about this the other day. American sports are designed much more differently than than the Premier League. Mm. And just because one, you know, idea or template worked in America doesn't necessarily mean it will work in the Premier League. And let's not forget that Arsenal is a, is a club of a much bigger stature than any of the other sports teams that the Cronkies own. So a, a, a misstep will go, will backfire in a very horrible way for the Cronkies. That's another reason why I think that someone like an Arteta uh, or, or an Henri or Vieira are not serious candidates because the Cronkies leverage Arsenal a lot. And any damage to the Arsenal will, will you know, see reverberations throughout the Cronky portfolio. So he owns the Nuggets and, what, a team in Avalanches, Arsenal, Arsenal. and the NFL team that he moved to? The LA Rams, correct. LA Rams. Um out of them, them fran- well, if you call them franchises or teams, however you want to word it, is Arsenal the biggest out of the four? By, by a country mile. Oh, I would yeah, imagine right. that if you, yeah, if you add up the value of all his Amer- American teams, maybe you would get in, get in line with the Arsenal. Uh, Arsenal is what, £2 billion? Pounds? Um, as a, he's, as a reje- he's rejected £2 billion, so more. Some more, right? I would imagine an NBA franchise is 500, 600, but maybe even 700 million dollars, not pounds. Uh, the NFL would be 500, 600 again, and the Rapids and the Avalanche would be much lower. So we would be probably touching two billion at dollars, and okay. this is and he's rejected two billion pounds. So you know the Arsenal is was way ahead, way way ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, Tony MAA Gunner, what will happen with the current goalkeepers, and do you have any updates on goalkeepers coming in? Uh, I have no idea who we're going to sign. It's all gone quiet on that front. I still, again, if someone had a gun to my head and said, "Who do you think we're going to sign?" I'd probably go with Leno. 
Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know more than, than the next man. Um, I expect, I, I said before the game yesterday, I think Ospina played because it's the last time he'll play in an Arsenal shirt and they wanted to give him some minutes. He's, he's last hurrah, so to speak. Uh, so I think Czech will stay and Ospina will go. Um, you've got to remember now that we have a vacant position as a goalkeeping coach. Uh, there's a lot of thoughts that Lehman will take it, but it's not confirmed yet. But I wouldn't be surprised if, I don't think Czech will take it next year, but if he does hang around uh, and as a backup keeper to, to someone, then uh, he's probably being primed for that position in the future. Whereas if he knows, if he goes, that chance will probably not come up again. Uh, not only at us, but probably at many clubs, they tend to, especially specialist coaches like that, they tend to employ it from within. Yeah. Um, and it, unless Chelsea were to take him back at some point, I, I don't think he would get that chance again. So I'd imagine Czech will become number two and we will sign a number one. And as I said, I'll go with Leno at the moment. You know, you know much about Leno? Like no. So much of him? No. Schwinn, have you? No. A bit. Not a whole lot. But I feel like he he's a part of a team that that is let down, you know he's let down by his defense because Leverkusen is a very high pressing team, and they're very full throttle. So as as a shot stopper, I think he's pretty decent. He's got okay distribution. I'm not too kicked about the idea uh, about Leno. If I'm honest, I feel Timo Horn is a better goalkeeper than than Leno. I, I feel Jack Butlin is a better goalkeeper than Leno. So. It doesn't excite me, but I have an open mind. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know much about that Leno at all. I don't even think I've seen him. But I, I did get in a little bit of a thing the other day. Um, somebody was telling me Leno is better than Horn. So that was. Um, so I can only go on that. Though I, I haven't seen much. Of, I've seen Horn a couple of times. In the Europa League, but that's about it. So, um, okay, a few questions here from the Texas Gooner. So I'll go to you, Tony. A few questions on Ateta, since the rumours have been heating up. If we appoint Ateta, do we expect more of a meltdown or un or unified front in reaction from our fan base? Do you feel a Ateta, Ateta's appointment would have an initial negative implement on incoming transfers? Uh, the first part of the question, I think it would cause cause a bit of a meltdown. And again, as I said earlier, I think it caused a divide with some people saying just support whoever's in and other people going, oh, we're showing no ambition again, blah, blah, blah. So I think it would cause a meltdown. Uh, in terms of on transfers, probably not. Because again, long gone in the days where people sort of sign for the manager, especially within a head coach system. And as we've said, a lot of our targets have probably been identified already and already spoken to and they you assume would have been spoken to without knowing who the manager or head coach is going to be so say someone like max meyer potentially who we all know that we've spoken to whether we're going to get him or not is, is a different story but we've spoken to him and he would have been interested or not whether he is or not regardless of who the manager is so i, I don't think it would change targets massively and especially if you look at all the players we're linked with they're all sort of young players anyway and and it'd be a step up for them to go to Arsenal we're not looking at anyone like we did when we signed Ozil and Sanchez where you think wow they're coming from a, a bigger side and they're a big name so I think with the players we're looking at they would just probably be happy to be at Arsenal um, so the, the manager is or the head coach is not such a big influence in that decision mm, okay um, Schwinn K.S. Bryan says, I'm one of the few fans that are okay with um, a tether. If the management trio will, will involve Rules, Van and him. Uh, <laughs> and I only laugh because people people seem to think Sven's a, a, a mani- a, an, an assistant or a coach or something. He's only a scout, so I, I don't know why people... I have these great expectations on him, but anyway, uh, Schwinn, carry on. Carry on. You, I mean, you just basically stole my my one liner, and Raúl is even further away from from the on field stuff. He's a, he's a negotiator. He's he's someone who makes the deal. He's the one with the address book. 
you know, I agree that it's not a one man team, but it's definitely a one manager team. You know, we still need a specialist on on the pitch. And for all of Arteta's qualities, you know, he I'm not sure whether he understands all the different facets of the game. And maybe maybe that's being a little harsh, but I'm not sure if he can teach all the facets of a game to, you know, to different players of different positions. You know, Arteta has been great when he when he was with us. He was he was very good and he provided some excellent moments to us. There's no denying that. But management and coaching and motivation, all those things are, you know, are a different level. They're a different ball game. And I don't want to I don't want to insinuate that Arteta will never be a good manager. But at this given moment. Although I appreciate Brian, you know, being so optimistic, and I want to be the same, but you know, I think we have to be a little more cautious of what, what, what we're wishing for here because I'm not sure whether he's cut out for it. He, he hasn't shown it so far, and I think that's our biggest issue with him. If he does, obviously, we all are going to be happy, and you know, we'd be jubilant. But the fact that we haven't seen him perform in that capacity. It, you know, it has to be a question mark. There has to be some anxiety there, and I don't think I'm alone over there. I watched a movie on Netflix the other day. It's called The Scout. Clint Eastwood, I don't know if you've seen a baseball movie. Um, basically, it's a, it's a scout. He's an old-school scout who, who goes and scouts players with his eyes. Um, that's what Zven is. Uh, and then there's the other movie, Moneyball, um, you know, where they, with Brad Pitt, where they analyse the, the base, you know, the bloody odds and many, all the bloody stats and shit, and they buy players that way. That's not Zven. <laughs> so... He's a scout. He's not a coach. He's not a... He has no... I don't even think he'd have any opinion on tactics or anything on the first team. He would buy the... Scout the players, I'd imagine, go to the manager. I don't even know if he'd go to the manager. Maybe go to Raul or Ivan and say, listen, I I think this guy's a a, a great young player. We should look at him. We we should buy him. and, And, we, you know, I don't know how it works. But something along them lines... Um, Tony may be able to go a bit more detail on it, but am I going down the right path, Mark? Yeah, I mean, it varies club to club in how closely the um, the head of recruitment, as Sven is, and the, and the head coach or manager work. Obviously, as as at Dortmund, they had a huge falling out between Tuchel and Sven, and that led to, to Sven leaving. Um, it, it all varies club to club where, Sometimes a player will just identify the, I mean, sorry, the scout will identify the player and then they'll work with the manager to see how they could fit him in or if that player is a good fit for their club. So it could be that he's an excellent player, but doesn't quite fit into how they're going to play. Uh, and, and some clubs, they'll, so they'll miss out on that opportunity because it doesn't fit them, even though the, the scouts identified it. And then there's other clubs out there where basically the, uh, the, the scout, as Sven is, is a head of recruitment. And if he wants to recruit a player, he does. Mm. And then it's down to the head coach to fit that player in. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so he's got no say on tactics or how how you should play that player that I've scouted, or would he? Have well, that's a, so. This is what I'm saying. It depends if how the relationship is between the manager and the and the head of recruitment. So that was the issue at Dortmund that that Tuchel banned Sven from the training ground because he was trying to have too much of an influence tactically. Right. So he sounds like he does like to have a bit of a say then. Yeah, but I, I think it's got to be a um, a consensus between the head coach and and the scout or the head of recruitment. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, Dougie, he asked uh, Tony, does uh, Maitland Niles have the highest upside of any Arsenal player? You know what? I'm going to have to do a 360 here because earlier in the season I. I had well. I didn't say he would never be good. I'd said I'd never seen anything in midfield from him that impressed me. But he was very impressive against Man United. And when he came on yesterday, as I've said earlier, it just looked right. It just looked like the correct fit that this guy is meant to play here. And and he looked comfortable and he, he looked on that level. He, he he came into the game and I know it wasn't of the highest quality, but he just he, he blended into it. You wouldn't know that this is a young kid just coming on who's only really played two or three games in this position. Um. Highest upside? I, I don't know. I, I think, although Reese hasn't shown it, I still think there is potential for something very special there. Um, 
if you look at, I know it's going away from Arsenal, but if you look at Jaden Sancho and how well he's doing at Dortmund and him and Reese were sort of rated at about the same playing on the opposite flanks to each other, but it was them two were sort of the next big things for England. So if Reese can reach anywhere near that level that, that Sancho's reaching um, and obviously can go on to in the future, then then I would say Reese probably has the the bigger upside. Um, but Maitland Niles is, is looking a lot better at the moment. But I think Maitland Niles is also three years older. So it's maybe a bit unfair to compare to compare the two. Okay. So you rate Niles at this stage? Yes. You like what you see? Yeah, look, I, I, even when I said I didn't see him as a centre midfielder, I, I thought he was very good at fullback. Mm. I've never not rated him. I just didn't think he'd be a centre midfielder for Arsenal. Yep, yep. Okay. Well, I hadn't uh, seen enough of him. To- yeah, to make a decision. Yeah, and he's played in every bloody position, but he's done well. He's done well in just about every. Position. Oh yeah, no, as I said I. I mm. There's times this season where I thought I'd start him at right back ahead of Hector. Mm. Um, so I, 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 to be honest, I think it's very rare he's played badly. I just never saw him do enough in centre midfield to make me think, wow, this kid's going to be special. But as I said, United, he was very good, and yesterday, he just he looked like a duck to water. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look out for the future, hopefully. Um, okay, I right, Charles says, "Hey guys, love the pod. Great, great work. Thanks, mate. Um, we love having you listening and asking us questions as well. Um, what are the top three things to say to yourself as a fan to motivate your own self if, <laughs> if Ateta becomes manager, and or if Allegri becomes manager? Schwinn, Ateta first. He's an Arsenal man. He's been here. He's been inculcated into, you know, the club's values. I think that could be one. The second could be he understands the midfield. And I, I look at someone like Ron Shaka. I think he could massively improve in his positioning. Be very careful, Arteta. buddy. Very careful. You could go to guess <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know I, no, I'm, no, I'm a Shaka fan no, as well. Just, yeah. Go, man. <laughs> yeah, but I think the one place, and we spoke about this uh, briefly last week, that the one place both of us you know, thought he could improve is his positioning to compensate for his pace. And I thought Arteta did that very well during his time with us. You know, despite uh, being old and he not having the legs, right? So I, I look at those two things, and, I, and I'm I'm trying to search for another one to cap off answer. But there's really not a whole lot I can think of. Maybe from from the board's point of view, it could be that he'd be happy to work in a limited budget. You know, as a fan, I, I'm not necessarily very fond of that idea, but I think that would help the board in one way, and maybe that, you know. That is motivation for them, not for us. Okay. Now so they, that and then Allegri is your next right. one. Right. Yeah, on Allegri, he'd fix up our defense for sure. He'd not be, you know, he'd be tactically flexible, so he's not sticking to one system, uh, despite who we're facing home or away. And I think he's happy to drop your your star players. You know, as much as I love Mesedozo, I think there is capacity to drop him every now and then in certain fixtures depending on our opponent and if especially if you're playing them away from home unless he proves us wrong you know over the next season or so but i think arson usually picked his you know best 11 instead of the best suited 11 for a particular game and i don't think allegri would necessarily do that and i think that's another reason why all of us want allegri more than say an arteta or a luis enrique hmm. tony Arteta, um, motivate yourself. I'm, I'm going to do this backwards. I'm going to go Allegri first, just because okay. they're, they're quite opposites. So Allegri, uh, he's a winner. He's He's been there and done it. And as, as Schwinn said, I'm going to nick tactically adaptable. Um, with Arteta, I think it's the opposite. It's fresh. They're new ideas. No one knows, uh, including us, which is a bit scary, but the opponents don't know how he plays. Imagine coming to set up against Arsenal on the first day of the season with Arteta in charge. And yeah, I know it'll be worrying for us as fans thinking, I don't know what we're going to do, but how does an opposition set up for that? That, that? They ain't got a clue either. So I think it's, it's fresh, it's new, it's tactically adaptable. And a lot of us have called for a young manager with the, that's uh, in touch with the modern game. And Arteta is very much in touch with the modern game. He was playing, what, two years ago? Was it? Yeah, two years ago. He was. So this weekend, two years ago, he made his last appearance for us. Mm. So I think 
No, as much as I, I don't want him, and I've obviously made that very clear earlier, I, there, there is obviously some positives. I just think the negatives outweigh that. Yeah, I'm um, looking at Arteta and I'm thinking, I just hope he had a fucking great apprenticeship under Pep. I think if he brings that style of football, it, and, and if it takes, because Pep, he will, he, will build a little, he will build a team, but he'll ask for a big budget, obviously, to build that team, but it may take two to three years' time. So if Arteta's that type of manager where he says, OK, we've got to fix these problems, but this is the budget I've got to work with and we've got to fix, we start with our defence, we start with our keeper, we move forward. I know it's a slow process, but they're not going to give him $300 million in the summer to, say, fix the team to make it a winning title chance. So I'm hoping, though, that he, he, he will bring that Manchester City style of play um, what he's learnt under Pep, I'd imagine. I, I, well, I don't know. We don't know, do we? Um, Allegri, I like how he can um, tactical changes on the go. Uh, you know, midway through a game, he he he'll he'll make them changes. Um, where we are so used to Arsene Wenger putting the plan on paper, throwing the team out there. And hoping for the best. And if we lost the game, he'll go, I don't know why we lost that game. I'm not sure why we lost that game. Um, so I like the fact that Allegri can can think on the fly um, and make tactical changes as we need it. And and the other thing I like about Allegri, he start, like if, if you've got a game coming up, and this is where we have struggled with anger when we've always been critical of it, <laughs> Do, do that, does he study video or does he seem to, you know, he, he seems a bit of an old school manager um, where I believe Allegri watches hours and hours and hours of video um, prior to to the game, a little bit like um, Simone at Atletico Madrid. They, they really study the opposition. So um, so I like that about, I like that about Allegri. Um, I think that's about it. With that... Uh, Hack on Larson. This is just breaking, by the way, boys. Uh, PSG have confirmed Tuchel as their manager for next season. Oh, there you go. PSG. That'd be that's a good that's a good get, really. It is. He would, he would be. Uh, mm. <laughs> yeah, I think since March it's been known that he's he's signed on on a two-year deal, uh, but. He would have been a good fit for us if it had not been for you know Sven and some of the history there. I think he played some fantastic football at Dortmund, but I think you're right. Has um, PSG have bagged a, a very very good prospect there. Mm. Okay, um, hack on Larson, Schwinn. Just how did we manage to sign a Bamiang? <laughs> um, I think he is pretty good, but still needs. Still feel like he's running around eighty to ninety percent and has so much. More power, more power and pace. He'll be very important next season. He will be, and I'm not sure whether I have felt the same. Whether when it comes to him performing at 80, 90 percent, if that is the case, then we're surely in for a treat. And he's in double digits, and he's only started playing in the Premier League since February. I think he's got more goals than Morata and Hazard combined. I read somewhere or something to the tune of that. Uh, so, he's got more. He's got the. He's got more or the same amount of goals as Morata and the same amount of assists as Hazard. There you go. So you know he's been with us for. You know he's been in the Premier League for maybe what one third of that time of of them two, and he scored. You know he's he's provided those numbers, and more importantly, he's looked good while playing as well. Which you know suit. Which is what you want from an Arsenal player because it's not just about numbers. It's about the fluid play, and he's adapted very well. I think we have to give credit to Ivan and Sven here because we know that Arsen wasn't necessarily going to pull the trigger on this. And this signing, albeit with his blessing, was sort of forced down his throat. So, you know, it was about leaving a stamp of authority and and a very good one at that. We, we were fearful that, you know, he'd be shunned to the wing and maybe he's not going to perform there, but he's continued to perform from there as well. So, uh, I agree with Hacken. It's, it's been a very, very good signing. Maybe a little too expensive for my liking, but you know, sometimes you have to cough up that extra few quid to to get that quality. Okay. 
Um, yeah, he's playing good at Bamiang, hasn't he? Like, really. I'm looking forward to next season. I, I just still, I always still wonder though, how are you going to part, how are they going to, you know, Lacazette and Bamiang together? Be interesting. Um, okay, Chazza 17. Uh, Tony, is Allegri happening? Straight up. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Don't. Nah. It's hard. He, 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 I just think he is still. I know he's no longer the bookies' favourites, and I think he's third now. We was just saying, but for me, he is still the favourite uh, in what both in what I would want and in what I think will happen. I still personally think Allegri is more likely than any other choice. Mm. Hello, L. Can I have $1,000 on Brendan Rodgers to have Arsenal manager? Thanks, mate. <laughs> All right, boys. I'm on, Re- I'm on Brendan Rodgers. Connor White. I fucking hope it's not Brendan Rodgers, just quietly. I hope I haven't put the jinx on us. Um, <laughs> Schwinn, what signings would you like to see Arsenal go and try and get? I think maybe we should reserve this question for next week. Yep, can do. Yeah. Yep. Because we can throw a different one at me. Yep. Yep. Okay. So just we'll bag that one for next week, Connor, because we're going to do our season thing and players and whatnot. Uh, Red Falcrum. Then, what's wrong with you? <laughs> There's a lot wrong with Schwinn. <laughs> nah. What's What's wrong with with we should sell Ozil from fellow listener on last week's pod? Who was that? Was I can't that? remember, but someone did ask the question. That was Tony. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, was it? Did someone say that? Maybe it was there was uh, someone, So the question though. we had the question came in and we both me and Schwinn both said that we don't think that should happen and you said sell him. Oh, okay. It was Vish, wasn't it? I, I can't remember. Sorry for whatever it was. Yeah, okay. But I can't remember. Red Falcrom. Um <laughs> from a fellow listener on last week's pod. Remember, guys, a few years ago, we don't have luxury to bring players like him in now. We justify absolutely everything to sell him, and people people fall into the narrative like he doesn't perform or care. You want to go anywhere on that, Schwinn? Look, there's nothing wrong with the idea of, of selling Mesut Ozil, but you have to consider what we'll get for him and whether that's going to be worth it. I mean, in today's market... Anything less than, you know, as I said, 70, 80 million is is not worth it because, you know, people will know how much money we have after a sale of Mesut Ozil, for example. And then automatically the premium goes up on a player. A player that's going to cost you 35 is going to cost you 45 or 50 soon after. I, I can see an argument for it. And as much as I love, love Mesut Ozil, if it's for the better of the club, I would be happy to sell him. But a new manager can easily come in and look at his quality and build the team around him and honestly make us into, you know, a, a team that challenges at the very top. Of course, I'm being very optimistic here, but I don't think that Mesut Ozil would be at fault for us not being challenged, you know, not challenging at the top. I think he has, you know, he provides the core of an attacking player to be able to do that. I think what people also need to see is that our, our problems lie in defense, which can be solved with simple organization at times. It's not necessarily about getting the funds and then dishing those funds back out again. Spending money is not directly proportional to moving up the table. Look at Everton. So we said this on this podcast time and time again. It's all about structures, roles, and organization. And with that, we can become a much better team. So selling Methodozil may not even be a, you know, an option at that point. Yeah, I think I think we did mention it last week just quietly because it was eighty, ninety million dollars, and I think it was on the basis that if we got a fund, sell him the fund, other transfers or something. I I can't remember what it would fucking sell. Um, okay, Shree says, um, what are the major factors the club would be considering during the hiring process of the next manager, Tony? Look, we don't know because if you look at the shortlist, there's been, there's a lot of experienced people on there that are, or the believe shortlist. There's a lot of uh, experienced people on there that have won trophies and have experience in handling big clubs and big players and dealing with the amount of media that you get as a as an Arsenal Arsenal player or manager. 
But then there's Arteta on there who's got none of the above, really. So I don't know what... Imagine it like Stats DNA where they put a load of things they want into a computer and it pops up with a player. Mm. With the manager, I don't know what things they'd be putting into that computer because, as I said, Arteta is completely different to everyone else that's being rumoured. Mm. And if if they want sort of a young uh, forward-thinking approach and that's why Arteta's being linked, then you'd expect to see people like uh, Nangelsman um, linked, but you haven't really, and that may be the next big, the next name we get linked with heavily. I don't know, but that's what you would expect to see if that was the the characteristics they want. So it's very hard to tell what what characteristics they're looking for because the short list that we've led to believe is so spread out amongst different skill sets. When Bournemouth got promoted and uh, Eddie Howe was the, the you know the big legend. Um, <laughs> You probably remember he was heavily linked to being the next manager at Arsenal. Okay. Yeah, that was more on that was more on continuing how Wenger played because Eddie Eddie Howe is seen as uh, a footballing man. He plays nice, attractive football, mm. uh, gets the ball on the floor. So that was more in that sense. That was a continuing of a Wenger thing. Mm. Uh, I think in the last few years, most people want us to move away from from the Wenger ball. Yeah, well, we're definitely not. I don't. I'm not sure where he even is, but I haven't heard nothing about Eddie Howe. It's been very quiet. Um, okay, Schwinn, take my poll pin. Rockatarian at Rockatarian. Uh, most big clubs are forced into defensive changes in recent years. Man U, Chelsea, Liverpool, City. Um, and he's rattled off a heap of names there. So basically, Man U, they suffered with the changes that they had to bring in. Uh, Chelsea, they struggled as well. Uh, Liverpool, they got Van Dijk and finished third. Uh, City spent big under Pep um, and has gone on as good as. Surely we follow suit. Not sure what the question will be no. right there because we're, we're already struggling, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. I mean, even without any of these changes, we're already struggling. But... I think this provides some motivation for the for the younger players. You know, it's a, it's a it's a dawn of a new era, and we've seen in the last couple of weeks that some players have really you know kicked it up a notch. As you mentioned earlier, Callum Chambers has impressed a lot since that horror show against Ostersunds at home, and I completely agree. So, although there is you know reason to worry about our defense from from what we've seen this season. I think there's there's not a whole lot that can go further wrong. You know, we've seen our waveform this year. It's been abysmal, to say the least. And there there seems to be this consensus around the club that we need someone who can, you know, fix up our defense. And we're on the right trajectory with that. But some of the names we've been linked with more heavily, I think, underscores that to a certain extent as well. So I wouldn't be too worried about that. I think we're thinking about too many specifics at this point, and it's only natural. But I think it's better to judge all of this once we have a new manager named. Mm. Um, okay, we'll push on through. I'll answer this one because I, I agree with this guy. Um, Savesh, 831C. Uh, don't you guys think we, we were picking on O's a little too much? I mean, just four months ago, everyone was begging him to sign a new contract, and now they want to sell him just because he had two, three bad games. His form during the Christmas period was phenomenal. Um, and was playing every game. I, I, I look. I have to agree. Um, you'd agree with that, Tone? Yeah, I massively agree. I'm shocked you do, seeing as it was you that uh, was so big on Urzel watch, and reminded of us it every time he didn't have a ten out of ten performance. But yeah, I, I massively agree. I think that he is our best player. He's our biggest name, and we expect the most from him. So when if he doesn't deliver, and even someone like Ramsey, who's for me been our player of the year, doesn't deliver, it's always going to be Ozil that you pick on because you expect more from him. Do I agree with that? No, but that, that's the way the media works, and, and fans in general seem to take in what the media say, I think, too much. Uh, but they, they run with the media, the lines that the media spin. So I can see where it comes from. I completely disagree with it, and I, I, I completely agree with uh, the guy that asked the question. I, I can see where it comes from. 
Yeah. yeah. No, I, I admit, I admit, I have been not critical of Ozil, but I, I sometimes, well, I wanted to put together like on this podcast a bit of an Ozil watch because we didn't, you know, you were one that don't want to go on the stats and things like that, and 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 it and it is headlines week in week out. Uh, did he perform or did he not? And and big games, he, he just seems to go missing. Um, I don't know why or what 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 that is. You you mentioned that the fact that it's just a media beat up, but there's been a few times where I can think, even against Atletico Madrid, he he went missing. He was not there at that game. Um, yeah, uh, so that was basically what it was on, um, and probably because yeah, he is he's our He's, he's our grand big player at the moment. So, oh, well, Bamiyang and Lacazette are there as well. But I, I'm seeing, I'm seeing results from from a Bamiyang. I'm not seeing results from Lacazette, um, but a Bamiyang, yes, we are seeing that he's worth every cent that we pay for him. Lacazette's good, don't get me wrong, and he's, but he's just not, he's just not where we want him yet. <laughs> Um, I think he can improve a lot next season. Um, Dean Potter, is there a strong case bringing in... Uh, you mentioned this before. Nagel Smith, his bright young manager who's looking to progress in his career, Schwinn. Look, he's done very well. There's no doubt. You know, someone like Serge Nabry has been transformed under him, but... Again, it's it's such a massive step up, you know. Uh, I don't think Nagelsmann has has a lot of Champions League experience either. I mean, I, I put him in the same bracket as as a Hardem, but Hardem, on the other hand, has had so much more experience. You know, they're the same age almost. Maybe Nagelsmann is a few years younger because I know he's in his early thirties, if I'm not wrong. But I, I I'm, I'm not I'm not too keen on him. Uh, as our next manager uh, for one reason uh, or the other. Also, I think he, he, you know, we're looking for someone who's going to be a coach, not a manager. I think that's a very important distinction to keep in mind. And Nagelsmann's ways are very strict and structured. I don't know how flexible he is. And, you know, for lack of a better word, he's almost anal about certain details. Which can be good, but I'm not sure whether he's the man suited for the Arsenal. Yep, okay. Um, Sean says, Tony, if you could if you could sign any three players in their prime from previous years for next season, who would they be and why? As in ex-Arsenal players or just in general? Uh, if you could sign any three players in their prime, so any any three players in their prime from the from previous years for next season, who would they be and why? Uh, so the romantic in me would say Vieira, just because it's a position we're severely lacking in. Um, Cafu and... I'm trying to think who the best centre back of my lifetime is. <laughs> um, Maldini. Too small. Uh, I mean, he did come to mind, but he's too small. Nesta. Nesta. There we go. Nesta for Arsenal. <laughs> okay. Uh, Schwinn, do you want or do you want to have a crack at that too? Um, I pretty much agree with everyone Tony said. I mean, you know, we're looking at positions at this point. I'd probably look for a goalkeeper uh, in, in place of a right back. So could probably throw Neuer into the mix. And uh, instead of Vieira, since we've already seen him in Arsenal shirt, I'll go for someone who's in a non-Arsenal player, and I'll say Bastian Schweinsteiger. No, no. Shock. <laughs> 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 um, okay, Shri the Guna says, which teams do you see as title contenders and relegation contenders next season? Schwinn. Very hard to do relegation Ooh. because I don't think they're promoted yet. Oh, well, we, who do we know <laughs> right. is there? We know Wolves are there. Um, I think Fulham Darby, is going to make it as well. Derby and Fulham are still fighting it out. They've got a game on Wednesday, haven't they? 
Uh, yeah, so the, the, it's one of it's one of Villa, Middlesbrough, Derby, or Fulham. One of them four will come up along with Cardiff and Wolves, who are already up. So just go Cardiff or Wolves. All right, they're in there. Yeah, I think Huddersfield are going to struggle a bit too next season. Um, you know, for for as good of, as lucky of a season that they had this year, I think they might be fighting down bottom as well. But it's of course tough to say at the moment. I think that the, the fight up top is going to be much more interesting. I think United are going to show up next season. I think City are, of course, going to be favorites coming in. And it has to be Liverpool. You know, right now, I don't want to necessarily hype us up a whole lot since we really don't know where we're going. But at the moment, I think those three teams from the greater Manchester area are going to be, uh, you know, definitely the, the top shots coming into the season. Tony? Uh, I think City will win the league. Um, I just I don't think they need, huh? Yeah, Break I don't think they need to. Yeah, they won't bring anyone in that's going to rock the boat. Like they're not going to lose anyone that, that a major player, and they won't need to. They don't. I think they probably will bring in a couple of players just for the sake of it. But they don't really need to anyone to integrate within the squad. Whereas Liverpool are bringing in uh, Naby Keita, who's going to be a huge part of their team. You'd imagine. Um, and again, obviously he's not going to the world cup, but with the world cup implementing them, building him into the squad and you've got to remember, I mean, I don't know exactly how many points, but it's double digits of points. What they were off. Um, I think it's, it's over 20 points. They were off city Mm -hmm. make up a 20 point gap is, is a lot. Uh, so I I would expect, I would expect, um, city to, to still win the league. Uh, Going down, I agree with Schwinn. I think Huddersfield uh, will be in trouble. Um, I I can't see Cardiff doing much. Um, I think Warnock is an excellent manager at championship level, um, but I think that's his limit. Um, And then the third one, obviously we don't know who it is to come up. Trying to think of current Premier League teams that I could see struggling. Uh, I think Palace could be in trouble if they lose Zaha. Although, again, I think Hodgson's a very good manager at that level. Um, so, But if they lose Zaha, I think they could could be in trouble. I wouldn't necessarily say they'll go down, but I think it'll be a very long season for them. Okay. I'm just going to throw in, yeah, Man City and Liverpool to fight it out at the top. I think Liverpool will um, uh, next season. I wouldn't be... Manchester United, What uh, with Mourinho, he's renowned to win a trophy eventually what usually two seasons in three seasons in so next well that'd be his third season next year at Man U won't it um, yeah but it's usually winning the second get sacked in the third for Mourinho yeah, I'm just trying then to I think, think yeah. I think United are always going to be solid um, they're they've got a big squad I think the, one of my issues with Liverpool is their squad isn't big enough um, obviously they may add to that this summer we don't we do, remains to be seen Hmm. But I think United, uh, Mourinho, he's never, uh, well, saying that, he has had teams do poorly in the past, but it, I, I'd imagine them to come second or third. I'm just going to throw a wild card in, and um, if Leicester City don't keep Mares, I'm going to say they might, they could be in trouble. I think he's um, he's going to be hard to replace. That's if he does go to, which we will never know, we won't, well, we'll know in the summer, I suppose. Um... Cardiff will go back down. They won't stay up. Who's the other one coming up? Wolves. They'll, they'll actually they they might surprise. I think you're saying you. I think they'll come. I think they'll come top ten. Yeah, yeah. I reckon they'll be. I reckon they'll be mid table at least. Um. Okay. We'll try and keep it Arsenal because otherwise I'll get sidetracked. So, uh, hack on Larson. Uh, who was that? I'll go to Tony. Will an, inex- will an unexperienced manager be able to close the gap between us and the other top five clubs? New signings will be uh, viable, of course, but I think you guys know what I mean. <laughs> we are far behind. And don't lie. The table doesn't lie, he says. Tony? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I think an inexperienced manager is capable because there is some of the things that are wrong at Arsenal are fundamentals. It's whether they have the influence and the players listen to them and respect them enough to, to, to listen to them. Essentially. I, I think 
there's a lot of managers that are capable of coming in and improving what where our weaknesses are, but it's how it's the influence they have on the players which worries me. Um, for example, Ramsey and and Jack were both keeping Arteta out of the team three years ago, and now he's going to come in and tell them what to do potentially. I, I don't know if they'd have a problem with that, and I know the party line is to say that are oh, they're they're professionals and they'd listen to whatever the manager tells them, but. Deep down, I'd imagine it's got to be somewhere in the back of the head. And not only them two, there's obviously many players in the squad that are in the same boat. That somewhere in the back of the head, I think that doubt, that niggling doubt will remain there. Sure. Whereas if it is, say, an Allegri. Yeah, whereas if it is an Allegri, they'll go, well, this geezer's won four Italian titles. Mm. Uh, he's in the Champions League final twice. We, we should probably give this guy's ideas a chance. Mm. Um, experience, that's my worry the, the experience is a key experience is a real key I agree totally with you and respect's another key and if they don't respect Arteta he's going to have problems from the start he's going to cop it from fans if he loses a couple of games he could cop it from players he could lose a dressing room within first 10 games it could be very hard um, Big Bad Wolf Says Schwinn, so with all this talk of assumptions of the two, Allegri and Oteta, do you think it's possible that Allegri gets the top job and Oteta become part of the coaching staff? Could it work? Well, I, I think of it from Arteta's perspective, and why would he want to leave City? You know, maybe he has an affinity for Arsenal and he wants to deserve our club. But I really don't see any reason for him to do that from a career perspective. You know, he's going to learn much more uh, at, at City. And when it comes to his upside, his career, I think he'll be better off continuing that role and then maybe taking, you know, a, a job elsewhere. As, as you said, Tez, maybe in the championship. It could work, you know, but I don't know from, from an Arteta perspective whether he'd like to do that. Yeah, okay. Um, another one from Arteta from Akron Larson. Tony, uh, Arteta would be the easy way out. Same with Vieira, and they would be the very Arsenal like thing to do. Yeah, got a point. Uh, we would get behind them, but like most of us, would would be a sort of disappointed. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I covered it pretty much uh, earlier in the podcast that so I don't overly want Arteta. I would happily back him. Uh, as I said, I'd back absolutely anyone, but I, I don't want him, so I think I'm just pretty much in agreement with the question. I'll continue on, Harkham Larson. I know we shouldn't get too much into the media and what and what they say regarding a new manager, but you need more than a few years in as assistant and a pundit on the MLS to take an Arsenal ex-player. Would any other top six hire an ex-player as a manager? I don't think so. Too risky, Tony. Yeah, I mean, when I, I saw this question came in, and I immediately thought, when when Rogers was was finishing at, at Liverpool, did they appoint Steven Gerrard, who, let's face it, is a much bigger legend at Liverpool than Arteta is at Arsenal? As I said, I personally don't even class Arteta as a legend. I don't think many do. Um, and Liverpool didn't go that, down that route. When Chelsea are, are almost certainly going to replace Conte this summer, have they been giving Frank Lampard a call? Well, I've not seen that rumour anywhere. No. Um, when when maybe Man United, even when, when uh, Moyes was flopping, people were saying, give it Giggsy, get Neville's in, but they didn't go down that road. They, road, they went down Van Hull. Uh, so, no, the, I mean, the answer is no. No other top six clubs would do it. The only clubs and they've had I the can, opportunity. Yeah, well, the only clubs that I can think of is obviously Barcelona, Real Madrid, and they're the only ones who have been game enough to do it, like Barcelona. Um, they've done it on... Oh, geez, a couple of occasions now. So yeah, I mean, I, I think it's very different with them where someone's been groomed for the role um, and it's been a long-term expectation. So, like, say Zidane at Madrid, he, he had their B team there under whatever categories they have there, 21, 23. Yeah. I'm not sure what they have. Yeah. Uh, so he's been groomed for the role. We're talking about someone who has had no experience, not at our club or, or another club, or he's never actually managed a side. So Zidane managed the B team or managed the under whatever age group. Mm. The same with Enrique, the same with Guardiola. Arteta, and I think that there's a bit of an error in the question saying that bringing an assistant in, he's not even an assistant. He's a coach. 
which mm. is one step down. So he's two steps away from ever having has worked as a manager. He's never picked a team in his life. He's never had to set the form, the, the tactics or the formation himself, um, which I know it was only at under 23 and B level that the Guardiola's and the Zidane's did, but they still had to do that. They still had to pick a team, choose a style, choose a system. Arteta's only ever worked within other people's systems. Geez, you're killing me. I thought he had some fucking some some something. He's never even done a B team. No. Fucking what about the under sixes somewhere? Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> would, would that make you feel any better though? <laughs> Fuck mate, well, well, this is this fucking I've written these bookies up. They got it wrong. I can't see Arteta coming in. I hope not. Fucking dead. Um okay, let's push through. Which Steve O for you, Schwinn? Uh, which would you rather happens? We get an experienced big name manager with ruthless. <laughs> hang on, who's ruthless? Sells Ramsey, Ozil, and Jack to fund a rebuild. That is fucking ruthless. Um, or we get an inexperienced manager, keep Ramsey, Ozil, and Jack, but don't sign any other proven world class player, just youth and with potential. Good question. The, the former, an experienced big name who who does a rebuild and is. <laughs> happy to sell some of his players look the weight i want to put on an experienced manager his importance is much more than an inexperienced you know as you were reading this question out Tez, what all all i could think about how is how tony has been saying what sven's signings could mean for us in the worst case you know that we become a feeding club and i feel that with an inexperienced manager who is only trying to buy uh, you know, youth with potential. If success is not coming, then the only way we can keep the ship steady is by selling our players. You know, the youth, upcoming youth who who can become star players at the Arsenal, but they're being sold for one reason or the other. You know, that's the last thing for 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 us. You know, for what I want our club to become. If we do go with the former and sell some of our star players and fund a rebuild, at least there is a plan in place. You know, we have some players and, of course, selling these players will also mean bringing in some other big name and quality players. So we have some players who can attract other managers, even if the first manager doesn't become a success. So I, I fear the fact of going down the, the lane of becoming a, a feeding club. And to avoid that, I would definitely be happy to sell Mesut Ozil, Aaron Ramsey, Jack Wilshire and whoever you want to add to that list. Mm hmm. Tony? Uh, whatever option is most likely to bring success. And then I think you're going down a, a personal preference. Um, I, I find it a tough one because I think if you do sell them free it, with a manager coming in and changing style and system, and I say sell, and obviously Jack's not really involved in the sales process because if he goes, he'll go for nothing. Um, but I, I think you maybe set us back potentially even further with not only the players that are currently there having to learn a new system, new styles, new roles, but they're also going to have to learn to work with pretty much a whole new set of players as well, seeing as we do base pretty much everything around Ozil and, and Ramsey. Um, I, th I think that way is probably less likely to bring success. I have no fear of, of selling our big name players, um, especially if it is to, to, to fund um, improvement. Hmm. But I, I just... I think it would. I don't think this would be the year to do it because I think we're going to have all new ideas coming in as it is. So see how these players with a few improvement improvements work with whoever the manager is, and then in a year's time reevaluate if in a year's time we need to. I know it's not really it's not really going to be a question in a year's time because Ramsey will a decision will have been made by then the same as Jack and Urza will be a year older, but I, I I think the question would be a better one this time next year. My only problem is, is um, <laughs> every other team out of England seems, or uh, the Premier League, seems to know that, it, you know, like Malcolm, for example, um, I, what was, that was a, a Sven type of target, Malcolm, and it's it's pretty been, you know, pretty noted. But let's say if he wasn't an Arsenal target and he was a. Uh, oh, I don't know a, a, a team in the let's say Roma for example. Would he be that? Would he be that expensive 
if it was Roma going for him and not Arsenal. It just seems that there is no youth with potential these days because the youth, these these teams seem to know what the youth is. There's Schwinn getting text I, messages. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you uh, to an extent that nowadays youth is... It's not seen as youth anymore. It's seen as potential, and potential seemingly has a higher value than than uh, real that people have already found their level because people are that the potential is he could do this, and you you nowadays you seem to pay more for the potential, say than that you get a player who's maybe a five out of ten but has a potential to be an eight mm. will be more expensive than a player that you know is a six point five or a seven because you're paying for that potential. And uh, in years gone by, that, that wasn't the case so much. So Malcolm's future potential, and um, that's pretty much what you're probably paying for now. Yeah, basically. Fuck, PSG played a lot from Mb- Mbappe, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, Mbappe is is probably a special case because, uh, I mean, I would argue I'm a huge Mbappe fan that he was already already probably up there in the, in the top 10 strikers in Europe at, at 17 years old. And then you're paying for the potential on top of that. But for me, I think there was a, a solid base to build from that. Even if he never improved again, he was still worth a hell of a lot of money at that level that he was already at. Mm. Okay. Uh, Schwinn, Coach Phil, what is going to be the toughest part of the job for the new manager? What do we as fans expect in the first 12 to 24 months? Results, 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 results. It's going to be very hard with you know the current crop of players we have, depending on who we sign. And Arteta might struggle, but that's not to say that an Allegri won't. And just because he's a big name doesn't mean that he's going to provide instant success. He has a higher chance to, but you know you, you can't take that stuff for granted. Having said that, I think the expectations for next season have to be top four. We have to get back into Champions League football. And anything other than that, even if... You know, we somehow managed to win an FA Cup, for example, uh, will will be considered a failure, I feel. So the next manager, whoever he will be, has two ways of making the Champions League, top four or the Europa League. And usually, you know, teams don't get two chances, you know, two different outlets to, to make it up there. So we should definitely follow the same game plan we followed for this season. Let the young boys have a run out for the early uh, early stages and then come February, March, assess where our season is going and then uh, accordingly then tailor our team for, for either of the of the competitions. I'm just going to set up an in the know Twitter account, Schwinn, at Football Kangaroo. Arteta is not coming. How's that? <laughs> you reckon I'll believe it? <laughs> I don't want him coming, boys. I don't want it. Um, Taiwo, I think I got that right. Uh, Tony, who do you feel will be Arsenal's next manager and why? Uh, as I said, I still think uh, Allegri will be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why? Just because I think he's. I know he's not out of a job, but I think he's he's available and uh, you could tempt him to come. And I think he is probably the best of what is available. Okay. Uh, Schwinn? Great. I, I don't think we would have let Arsene go without having, a, you know, having an identified target who we've secured. And it definitely wouldn't be for someone like Arteta. No disrespect to Mikel, but... Seriously, I'm let's not get to, ourselves. This I'm is... going to go Brandon Rogers because I'll put a thousand dollars on. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what's more, what's more valuable to you, a thousand bucks or, lose me or thousand the future? Of... I'm happy to lose it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm not even a fan of Luis Enrique. To be honest, boys, I don't, I don't really want him there either. So it has to be Allegri for me. He's the only one with a pedigree of winning. I'm trying to think who else would be there. Um. Well, I think it's probably un- unfair on uh, Enrique to say he doesn't have a pedigree of winning, but oh, yeah, true. I-, I get you. Shouldn't your point. say that. Yeah, probably shouldn't say that. Sorry, Barcelona fans. Um, 
Okay, Steve, Steve and Clear, realistically, how many players do you see us bringing in? I know we've been linked with, but the speculation, uh, to speculate, do you see us getting any big departures, Ramsey, Mustafi, etc., Tony? I'm convinced Ramsey's off. Uh, I've said it in December when I first said it. Um, I, I thought he was off, and what I saw yesterday, and uh, anyone that follows us on Twitter would have would have seen um, my tweet after the game, where I, I think he completely played for himself yesterday. And the last time I saw that was was Van Persie, and and I told myself then, obviously I wasn't on Twitter then, uh, that that Van Persie was off. I could just see by the way he was playing that he was doing everything for his own numbers and to, to increase his own valuation. Um, and I, I feel like Ramsey's doing the same. So I think Ramsey will be, uh, in terms of players, a big, a big departure this summer. Okay. You agree with that, Shreem? I hope I'm wrong. I like Ramsey, just to put it out there, because I know a lot of people think, oh, if you like Jack, you dislike Ramsey. And obviously everyone knows I like Jack. But I like Ramsey, and I want him to stay. I'm just basing this on what I saw or what I've seen. Yeah, yeah. You get that feeling, Shui? I do, and I get a similar feeling from Mustafi as well. I I don't know whether a new manager would want him around. The only you know skepticism I have towards that is that we'll need two center backs right off the bat to to start for you know for our starting eleven, and that that is a bit of a tall order, you know, when when it comes to the limited funds we have. So maybe a Ramsey sale plus a Mustafi sale can can bring you know can bring in the funds we need for three to four players. I don't know whether that will be the case or not, but I have to agree about Ramsey. You know, Tony's been saying that almost since the midway of this season, December, maybe even earlier, if I'm not wrong. And uh, you know, I don't I don't want to judge him on just yesterday's game, but if you just forget the game, you know, he has to sign the contract off the field. And there have been no updates, no developments on any of it, which which just screams that he's stalling and he's you know looking for opportunities. Okay. Um, David says, um, at most certainly he is. Do you think our next manager will still be able to work <laughs> with his jacket zipper, Schwinn? Sh- <laughs> oh, he's definitely not going to be very gift worthy then, is he? <laughs> uh, um, that's it, though. I think that's all the questions, boys. Did we get through them all? Unless a couple uh, ones have come through late. There's a couple there notifications, but I think we've got them all. So thank you for your questions, and uh, each and every week, and it's, it's great because it gives us, you know, lets us know what you're thinking as well. So. Um, lots of manager questions, so everybody is thinking on that page. So, and like I said, you can get them in at the clock end underscore talk. Um, next week's show, we're going to come back possibly next Sunday, and we were going to do it this week, but we did get lots of questions, which I'd rather do the questions anyway. But um, next week, boys, we're going to do a end of season review, and we're going to go through our teams our Arsenal players and work out who's who we should remove and who sh- should we sell. Is that right, Tony? Yeah, so in, out, loan, um, a, a review of the season, a look back at the season, we'll look for every member of the squad. Uh, hopefully there'll be some more managerial news or um, transfer news by then. Uh, I think we're going to have at least one guest, as far as I know, um, if you can call them a guest, I know the parameters of what a guest is have changed. I'm no longer a guest, um, <laughs> and uh, and yeah, so we'll go from there, and then of course we'll take your questions at the end. Okay, and I have also, and I'm going to throw him under the bus because I've spoken to him a few times, and I've tried to get the football mole in for some updates on Allegri as well, um, but he does work so like all of us, so I've got to try and catch him on a Saturday. Or a Sunday, so hopefully we might get him on for a chat at some stage. Would be good. Um, you got anything else, Dad Schwinn? Uh, just quickly in, in closing, I'll just say thank you, Barcelona, for also celebrating Arsene Wenger Day with us by losing yesterday and not being uh, invincible at the end of the season. So thank you very much for that. 
No worries. Um, okay, boys, it's been a pleasure as always. Love talking Arsenal with you boys, and um, we'll see you next Sunday. Cheers, Chitin.